Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf, Buffy Bocconi, and Bank for International Settlements workshop on real estate markets, outlook, risks, scenarios, policies. The pre COVID decade in many countries worldwide witnessed a protracted and large surge in real estate prices, driven by an extended period of exceptionally low nominal and real interest rates by changing housing preferences due to COVID and home working, as well as by demographics. Over the past two years, however, real estate prices have stopped rising or even started to fall in many countries. In real terms, adjusted for consumer price inflation, they have in fact been falling quite substantially in many countries. Commercial property markets are affected more severely than housing prices so far. Large property developers and owners are showing serious signs of stress. Some prominent cases are in default. Owners and financing banks are about to face substantial valuation losses which may also have to be realized. These developments are very prominent in China, the US and Germany, but also smaller countries like my own Austria are affected. So what is the further outlook for housing markets? What are future driving factors on the demand and the supply sides, both on the short and in the longer run? What are risks and side effects from real estate market developments? How will housing affordability evolve? How to square housing needs with environmental constraints and imperatives from climate protection? What measures might or should policy makers take in the areas of structural, fiscal, and macroprudential policies? This workshop brings together top real estate market experts and researchers from leading international institutions, central banks, and academia to discuss these themes in a compact practitioner and policy oriented format. The workshop is structured into two parts. Session one will for the first two hours deal with recent developments, the outlook, financial stability risks and macro potential policies. And session two in the third hour will address structural and tax issues and policies in real estate markets. The workshop will be moderated by Denise Egan from the BIS and Swerve's Vice President. Without further ado, over to you, Denise. Thank you, Ernest, and thanks to everyone, uh, all our speakers today for joining us. I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating conversation. We're very happy with the lineup today. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Jan and Barbara. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Jamurska, and I work at the ECB's Financial Stability Department. And today with my uh, colleague, Jan Hannes Lang, who also works in the same department at the ECB, uh, we've prepared a presentation about real estate markets in the euro area, and we will be discussing mostly the recent developments and also financial stability risks. The content that we are bringing is truly a joint effort. So our big thank you goes to colleagues who are also listed in the bottom of the uh, slide because they contributed uh, a lot of useful content here. Um, and before I jump into content, thank you very much also to organizers, uh, Ernest Ragana for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to speak at this event and uh, I'm looking forward to interesting discussions. We will cover both residential, which we abbreviate RRE, and also commercial uh, CRE markets. So when we say RRE, we actually mean something very simple. So just households purchasing property, taking a loan from banks. While when we mean, uh, when we say commercial real estate, we mean something much more complex because here we have a way, wide range of actors active uh, with various financing options. Some of them are international. So apart from banks, which are also active in residential markets, also funds are very important, um, uh, insurance companies or various specialized companies. And the complexity of this market also means that the links between the CRE and the financial stability will tend to be much more complex than the links between RE and financial stability. And this is something that we need to keep in mind when we analyze those markets. Um, but if we wanted to somehow compare these two markets, we would need to bring them to a common denominator. And the one uh, that we use uh, from the financial stability perspective is looking at RE and CRE from the perspective of bank exposures. 
And this is what I'm showing here in this slide. So in particular, in the left-hand side chart, you can see banks' exposures to RE and CRE. And you can see that mortgages account for almost 30% of your area bank's total loans, while CRE collateralized exposures are, are around 10%. So there is a difference in the size. So just looking from that perspective, we could conclude that RE is more relevant. And of course, just the pure volume is relevant. But what we also need to keep, into, uh, keep in mind from the financial stability perspective is the fact that CRE exposures tend to be much more risky from the historical perspective. And this is something that you can see in the right hand side chart, which shows information that we collected several years ago in an ad hoc exercise when we wanted to understand bank exposures a bit better. And there we found that the PDs, so the probability of the default, and LGDs, so the loan given uh, default, uh, is much lower for RRE loans than for CRE loans in the EU area banks. So this is something that we keep in mind as a starting point. And then, uh, and now we will go into more details about. Uh, first, residential estate market. I will cover that part of the presentation. And then commercial, um, this is when Jan will take over and uh, walk you through his slides. So on residential estate markets, if I were to summarize in just one sentence what is happening in those markets, I would say that residential property markets in your area are in a broadly orderly downturn. And this is something that we see when we look both at prices and at lending. So prices are shown in the left-hand side chart. Uh, here we are showing prices in levels. So we actually show the index um, from Eurostat, but also some more high frequency information that we have at the ECB for some of the Euro area countries. And what the left-hand side chart shows us is that the markets turned in late 2022. So this is when prices started correcting in nominal terms in the Euro area. But what we also see in that chart is that this correction is rather limited in size. And in fact, indeed, the most recent reading from the um, RRE prices in the euro area uh, from Eurostat, it's for Q3 2023, and it shows the price correction in nominal terms of minus 2%. So it's quite limited in, in order of magnitude. Um, and what we also see is that the pace of those declines seems to have slowed down recently. But that's in terms of development. Apart from monitoring just what happens, we also want to understand a little bit what could have driven those developments. And here we apply a model, a BVAR model developed by my colleagues, who found that the boom in RE markets, which started some years uh, following global financial crisis, seemed to have been um, um, supported at least to some extent by accommodative monetary, monetary policy, but also by loosening lending standards by banks. However, since 2022, so more or less when um, the cycle turned, uh, positive contributions from those two factors, monetary policy and lending standards, seem to have dissipated. And in fact, um, it's also a relationship that's quite well established in the literature that, that higher real estate, uh, higher interest rates are likely to put a downward pressure on house prices via reduced affordability of credit. Um, so indeed, this credit is also something uh, that we see in a downturn in the euro area. And this you can see in the right hand side chart, which shows the pure new euro area loans to households for house purchase in billions of euros. And here we have months in the X axis and one line per year. And we can see that the year 2022 started quite strong in terms of volume of loans, but then the volume started decreasing throughout the year and remained subdued in 2023 and also in the beginning of 2024 uh, as well. So overall, there is a downturn, but what is quite important uh, to mention as well at this stage is that despite this downturn, we don't see widespread RRE risk materialization in the euro area. So in other words, we do not see households defaulting on their loans. Um, but of course, we keep on monitoring that. So we keep on monitoring very closely what is happening. But of course, we keep on analyzing uh, the risks to financial stability from real estate. So in other words, we keep on analyzing what could go wrong. And that, that's the perspective that I would like to take now. So shifting from looking at what happened into what would need to happen to real estate markets to lead to financial instability. Um, and the short answer to that question would be that PDs and LGDs would need to increase in tandem because if they did or if they would increase in tandem, then that could lead to substantial losses in the banking se sector in the euro area 
to the extent that this could lead to a credit crunch or even some bank defaults. So both LGGs and PDs I will discuss based on this graphic. So the LGGs, this you can see in the bottom of that graphic, and the loss given default, this is something that is related to the real estate prices, in particular the real estate price correction. Because if a borrower defaults on a loan, and then bank needs to foreclose the collateral and then sell it, then if in the meantime, the price of that collateral, so the price of that property fell, then the bank would incur a loss. However, what's important here to flag is that this is a loss given default. So that means that the default needs to happen for the loss to materialize. And that is something that is shown in the um, upper part of the graphic, uh, where we show the factors that could drive an increase in defaults uh, on RRE loans. And one of them is rising financing costs and the other one is falling income. And in fact, uh, in the euro area for RRE, we do see raising or actually financing costs that's, that's raised so that uh, households are exposed to higher interest rates. But at the same time, we do not see falling income in a sense that the robust labor markets are currently helping to mitigate credit risk in mortgage portfolios. So that's a bit on PDs and LGDs in general, but now I would like to give you a bit more details first on LGDs and then on PDs, how we see them in the euro area um, potentially going forward. So let's start with the LGDs. Uh, so here I mentioned that this is something that is closely related to house prices and potential house price correction. So in the left-hand side chart, you can see house price overvaluation measured by house price to income ratio. This is one of several um, methods that we use in order to estimate overvaluation in the euro area. So we use several because we don't really observe overvaluation. We can only approximate it and hence it comes with uncertainty. That's why the more measures we use, the more confidence we can have, at least in the direction that they show us. But to be honest, this chart looked a little bit similar, regardless of which measure I uh, plotted here, in a sense that all of the measures that we have at the ACB are showing us that overvaluation of house prices in the euro area started raising around 2015-16 in the euro area. Uh, it continued increasing also when COVID started in 2020-21, because house prices were really strong then. Um, but then this overvaluation starts decreasing in the recent quarters when house prices start falling. Um, and when we put together this chart, which shows us that this house price overvaluation in your area, in your area is somewhere in um, double digits, it's country heterogeneous, but uh, at least in some of the countries it's quite, quite concerning. So if we put that together with the discussion on prices um, and the fact that in nominal terms they, the falls were rather limited, then this gives us a basis to discuss the right-hand side chart, which shows the tail risk to your area house price growth. So in terms of technicalities, what it shows us uh, is the output of our RRE at risk, uh, RRE prices at risk model that we have uh, in our department. And it shows the fifth percentile of predicted really year on year house price growth rate distribution. And what the chart shows us is that this downside risk to house prices that we capture with this model remains relatively elevated from the historical perspective if we compare to earlier periods, but that it decreased in recent quarters. So it's all consistent with each other in a sense that overvaluation decreased and overvaluation can be interpreted as a potential for price correction. So it decreased, that's why the downside risk is also less pronounced now, but at the same time, it remains relatively high, at least in some of the countries. So there could be still, uh, some uh, potential for better corrections uh, going forward. So that's on LGDs, and now a few words on the PDs in our markets. So I flagged that the things that could drive an increase in PDs in the RE markets could be, on one hand, an increase in interest rates. This is something that we did observe in recent um, quarters, so maybe we could already say years. Um, and on the other hand, also income is very relevant. So let me start with interest rates. Um, and here, of course, if a borrower comes for a mortgage now to a bank, they are charged the current interest rates. But the situation uh, gets a bit more heterogeneous when we think about those borrowers who took out mortgages before the interest rates started increasing. Uh, because how much they feel currently higher interest rates is actually quite heterogeneous between them. 
because on one hand we have borrowers with variable rate lending so of course then instantaneously they're charged higher interest rates on the other hand we have borrowers with interest rates fixed for life so they by construction they are never charged higher interest rates and there is also a group of borrowers in between who have interest rates fixed for some years so initially they are shielded from increases in uh, loan service to income ratios lsti's but then at some point the loan reprices and then they will feel higher interest rates and if we want to see what it looks like in the euro area uh, you can see that in the left-hand side chart. Uh, it shows us that around 70% of your area mortgages are extended with uh, fixed rate loans, or at least some fixation periods. Uh, but that's really heterogeneous across countries. So we have a group of countries which are on the left of, of that uh, left chart, uh, which have this dark blue part of the bar very high. So Finland, Baltics, Portugal, Cyprus. So in those countries, variable rate lending prevails. But on the other hand, we also have a group of countries more to the right of the chart um, with France, Belgium, Germany or the Netherlands, countries where borrowers are shielded from interest rates increases for quite a long time. So then as a next step, we wanted to understand a bit. Um, so as interest rates increase in your area, how, how did it affect the LSTI, so loan service to income ratios, of those borrowers and how does the situation differ between the fixed rate loans and the variable rate loans and this is the exercise that we are showing you on the right uh, chart of that slide it's a micro simulation exercise so we use micro loan level data set um, for eight euro area countries for which we have the data uh, and here we take the stock uh, from 2021 we look at uh, loan specificities and then we apply the interest rates increases as they actually were per country and we simulate those increases of LSTIs that we expect could have ha happened could have materialized in each case uh, and here what it lets us do compare the situation of those borrowers who had variable rate lending with those who had some fixation periods and there we can see that those borrowers who had some fixation periods were not only shifted from instantaneous increases of interest rates but actually, when their loans reprise or will reprise going forward, the increases in the debt service burden that they will be faced with will be rather much, much smaller and much more contained than in the case of variable rate lending. And in the case of variable rate lending, it seems that there is a fraction of the borrowers that could be exposed to really high increases of loan service to income ratios. Uh, if you see in the uh, right hand side chart, left part of that, there is this red fraction, which shows the increases of over 16 percentage points. And we also checked and those people who handed to, who tended to have such large increases in our simulation also tended to be those that were highly leveraged and had long maturity loans at origination. So that is on interest rates. I also flagged income. So for the for the sake of time, I'm not showing you here input of any model, but we also have a tool in place at the ECB which shows us that estimated PDs increase substantially when considering various scenarios, which would be combining the higher interest rates with higher unemployment. Uh, so in other words, so interest rates did increase, uh, but labor market is now quite robust. But if labor market were to deteriorate substantially, if unemployment were to increase, that is a scenario that would be really concerning from the financial stability perspective, as far as defaults are concerned. So I stop here uh, as far as Ari is concerned, and now Jan will take over for CRE. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Barbara. So I will cover commercial real estate markets, and I will first say a few words um, about the market itself. So what do we see happening there? Then I will move on to say something about what we uh, see uh, for commercial real estate firms. Then I will go on to say, okay, what's happening on, on banks' balance sheets in terms of asset quality and what uh, risk could there be for banks in terms of exposures? And then finally, I'm going to give an outlook uh, on, on financial stability and potential systemic risk em emanating um, from commercial real estate. So Barbara has already mentioned that residential markets are in a broadly uh, orderly downturn so far. So when we move to commercial real estate markets, we also clearly see that these markets are in a downturn, but this downturn is also more severe than what we see in residential markets. And also in our view, the market has not yet reached its trough. 
So further price drops are uh, likely going fo forward. So if you focus on the left-hand side chart here in blue, we show uh, the CRE price index or price growth for, for the euro area. And the yellow bars show the transaction volumes, year on year growth. So you can clearly see that there has already been quite a substantial price correction. So at the moment, we're roughly at minus 10% year on year uh, growth. But at the same time, we also see very limited market activity. So the yellow bars um, show that basically um, transaction volumes are down almost 50% uh, year on year. So there's very low uh, market activity, and this is to some extent also hampering price discovery in the market. So further price adjustments um, are likely or, or possible once also market activity resumes. And another indication of why potential further price corrections could be likely is shown uh, in the right-hand side chart. So here we show the office vacancy rate for prime office in the euro area. So you can see that this has been uh, increasing after COVID, but also more recently, this has been trending upward. And while the vacancy rate for, for offices is still considerably lower in the euro area compared to the US, um, this uh, vacancy rate is also rising. So potentially there, there could also be more headwinds uh, for, for prices due to uh, rising vacancies in a weak uh, macro environment going forward. Okay. So yeah, in our view going forward, the commercial real estate markets in the Euro area faces both cyclical and structural challenges. And we expect this market um, to remain yeah, in challenging conditions uh, for the foreseeable future. So on the one hand, um, basically the asset values for commercial real estate have been directly impacted by higher long-term interest rates uh, that have materialized over uh, the last two to three years. So on the left-hand side chart, um, we plot um, basically a share price index of real estate companies against the evolution of long-term interest rates in the euro area. So the blue line is, is this uh, share price index for the real estate companies. And you see that basically as interest rates, long-term interest rates have started to go up uh, considerably, also the share prices of these companies have dropped significantly. So we see basically uh, compared to the beginning of 2022, we see um, discounts in the share price of 40 to 50 percent. And you can also see that basically the, the core movement is quite striking between long term uh, risk free rates and, and this index. So this clearly shows that if interest rates um, stay at the current level, so long term interest rates, if they stay at the current levels or in the range of the current levels, this indicates that uh, the CRE market um, has sort of headwinds to, to expect from, um, from, from these higher financing costs. Because what you will notice is that basically these, the discounts in, in the share prices of these companies is considerably larger than what you saw uh, on the previous slide in terms of realized price adjustments for, for real estate assets. So here in, implicitly you can see that if the current uh, financing costs um, prevail, then there's more headwinds to expect um, in terms of price adjustments for, for the physical assets. In addition to basically higher financing costs, there are also other structural headwinds. Since COVID-19, there's a clear move towards uh, more home office and many companies are also reducing uh, the office space uh, they demand. And at the same time, um, also energy efficiency concerns are getting more and more relevant um, basically for, for the whole office sector. So these are two structural shifts that um, pose significant headwinds, especially for the non-prime office sector. And we illustrate this on the right-hand side chart um, where we show investors' expectations for the one year ahead rent growth uh, in the prime and non-prime office segment. So the blue line is, is the prime segment. And you can clearly see that Basically, both the prime and the non-prime uh, rent growth expectations for office have come down recently. But more importantly, um, for the non-prime segment, this is now uh, deeply negative. So um, investors expect this segment to, to have significant headwinds from the revenue side due to the fact that basically there's limited demand for, for these non-prime locations, but also non-prime and older office buildings often go hand in hand with low energy efficiency. So this puts an additional um, strain on the demand for these types of assets. 
and could pose uh, revenue challenges uh, going ahead for these types of assets. So given this sort of challenging market environment, we, we move on to, to ask, okay, what does this mean for firms who are active um, in, in the commercial real estate market? And here, here we clearly see that CRE firms face pressure both from the higher financing costs and the potential headwinds in terms of revenue that I also um, explained just before. So if we look at the actual data um, of profitability of real estate firms, you see this in the left-hand side chart. So we plot the median um, profit margin across a sample of euro area CRE firms. And you can see that this um, has clearly uh, decreased recently and even turned negative um, at, at the current end. So here you can already see that higher financing costs and some uh, revenue head, headwinds already mit, um, materialized in, in challenges for, uh, in terms of profitability. But of course, uh, it's important to ask, what is the outlook going forward? And here we did some simulations with micro data, and uh, we came to the conclusion that in a severe scenario of continued high interest rates and large drops in, in revenues for these firms, that almost 50 to 60% of Euro area banks CRE loan books could be to um, CRE firms that are loss making. So it doesn't mean that they default, but at least that these firms could be making losses. And you can see that illustrated in the right hand side chart. So um, this is the result from this micro simulation. And uh, the blue bars basically show the share of loans to loss making firms before we saw uh, the shocks from COVID and higher financing costs. And you can see um, basically in, in the first stack bar chart that just uh, the impact of higher financing costs already more or less doubles um, the share um, of loans to firms that are loss making due to these higher financing costs. We then ask, okay, what, how would this share change if on top of that, we also consider a significant drop in revenues of 20%. And you can see that basically in the second stack bar chart, that the share of um, basically loans to loss making firms could be between 50 and 60%. So this illustrates that CRE firms um, in an adverse scenario where basically revenues are severely um, reduced and financing costs stay high, that many firms um, could experience losses and potential problems. So then we ask, okay, given that we expect some headwinds for CRE firms, what does that mean for bank asset quality? And here I would say the good news is that so far asset quality has been holding on uh, or has been quite steady and, and, and solid also for CRE, but we're starting to see some deterioration and we expect more headwinds going forward. So on the left-hand side chart, we plot the net um, inflows into CRE and RE non-performing loans for your area banks. And you can clearly see that after years of outflows, so outflows mean the stock of NPLs is, is being reduced. We have recently started to see net inflows again, especially um, for commercial real estate loans. And this is uh, on a clear upward trajectory. So overall, these inflows um, still imply that Overall, the, the NPL ratio is not that high for CRE loans, but at the current end, we're seeing some deterioration, but this is only starting. In addition, um, when we look at the valuation of bank CRE collateral, we see that there has actually been quite limited revaluation of these collateral values in recent years, even though we have seen um, strong adjustments in, in market prices. And you see that illustrated on the right-hand side chart. So this is based on loan level data that we have for your area banks. And uh, you can see that basically the, the red um, bar part of the stack bars is the share of the CRE collateral where we had downward uh, revaluations. And you can see that um, this share of downward uh, revalued CRE collateral has stayed roughly constant. At least we didn't see a big uptick in these downward revaluations more recently. And this is an indication to us that potentially more asset quality headwinds and, and provisioning headwinds for banks from the CRE portfolio could come uh, in the future. So now given that I've illustrated that we expect asset quality headwinds for CRE, the big question is, okay, how important is that um, for banks and potential solvency? And I think the good news is that we look at euro area banks aggregate CRE exposure, 
these are quite contained, but we do see some banks that are quite heavily exposed to CRE and it's important to, to monitor this closely. So if you look at the aggregate CRE exposures, they're roughly 5% of total assets for the Euro area banking system as a whole. So in our view, this is not big enough to really threaten a solvency for the banking system on its own. So I think this is the good news. But then, of course, it's also important to look at the distribution of these exposures. And you see that illustrated in the left hand side chart. So here we basically plot for different country groups and the euro area aggregate. We plot the share of banking system assets according to how high the CRE exposure of the banks is. So the important thing to note is that for the majority of both euro area, but also country level banking systems, the majority of banking system assets are held by banks that have fairly contained CRE exposures. So let's say five to 10%. But you can also see that there's a group of countries where actually roughly 25% of the banking system assets are held by banks that have a CRE exposure of more than 10% of total assets. So that's the, the red part. And even within that tail, there's a share of banks that have significantly higher exposure. So in our view, um, it's important to keep this distribution in mind. And of course, the most heavily exposed banks may experience stress um, due to the challenging um, market environment that CRE assets is, is facing. So this is really aggregate banking system should not be a problem. It's really focusing on the tail. And I guess everyone is aware that more recently there were also news um, on some banks in, in Germany that are heavily exposed uh, to CRE. And there has been some market pressure um, more recently on, on these banks. So to illustrate a bit this um, so of the systemic importance or lack of systemic importance at, in the aggregate, we did some hypothetical simulations and you see that illustrated on the right hand side chart. So we basically do hypothetical shocks to the PDs and LGDs um, for, for the CRE portfolio. And then we look at the implied reduction in the CET1 ratio, depending on how high the exposure of the banks is. And here you can clearly see that you need to assume quite severe stress on the CRE portfolio. So let's say 20% PDs on the entire portfolio and LGDs of 40%. And in addition, exposures that are quite substantial. So at least 15% of assets or even more to generate really a significant reduction in the CT1 capital ratio for these banks. And given that uh, at the moment, uh, Euro era banks are well capitalized, and they have quite significant um, capital headroom. In our view, these sort of indicative simulations are a reassuring sign that it's really the, the institutions where stress could emerge are very few and tend to be very specialized banks that are in most cases uh, not really um, critical to the general credit provision um, in the economy. Given that basically banking system CRE exposures on their own are in our view not systemic enough to really cause solvency problems. So we see it more CRE stress could reduce earnings for many banks and for some banks it could also imply losses. But in general, we're not so concerned about solvency. The next question would be, so what would need to happen for CRE to cause systemic issues in, in the euro area. And here we see two potential channels. So one is if there were spillovers in terms of confidence to wider bank funding markets, or if also we start to see deterioration in other real estate port portfolios, then in our view, of course, um, the, the developments could become or get a systemic dimension. So in particular, if for example, covered bond markets became impaired due to um, concerns about uh, commercial real estate and stress in some commercial real estate lenders, then this could have systemic implications and really lead to sort of a credit crunch and, and um, constraints to credit intermediation. But the good news there is that so far we have not seen any indications of this. So in the left-hand side chart, we plot the euro area covered bond spread in blue. And the yellow and red line show these spreads for two banks that recently um, 
gotten more market attention regarding their CRE exposures. You can see that um, even though the spreads on the covered bond bonds for these banks started to increase more recently, there was no wider contagion of these spread increases. And overall, basically the covered bond market uh, still seems to be functioning uh, well. Then of course, the, the final uh, thing I wanted to make is also a link to, to Barbara's presentation. So while we say CRE exposures on their own are not large enough to really threaten solvency for the banking system as a whole, of course, if you take commercial real estate and residential real estate exposures together, they would be systemic. And while at the moment, as, as Barbara indicated, the residential portfolios seem to be much more stable and given basically the positive outlook for um, unemployment, in a baseline, we also wouldn't expect a severe stress in, in this segment in a baseline scenario. Of course, we have to monitor this closely and should unemployment increase unexpectedly uh, going forward and should we see more stress on the residential portfolio, then of course, uh, CRE together with RE stress could become a systemic. So um, this was it from my side um, and we're very happy to, to hear your comments, views um, and, and questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Barbara and Jan. Um, without delay, let me pass the floor to Prakash. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, thanks, Denise, and thanks to all the organizers for uh, inviting me to comment on these uh, excellent papers by the ECB. Um, there were four papers that were uh, circulated, and uh, I thought they made a excellent package of material to uh, assess the risks facing uh, CRE and RRE markets uh, in the euro area. Uh, as I said, this is sort of excellent work, and from the very clear presentations that you just heard, uh, it highlights some very clear risks in commercial real estate markets. Um, it's reassuring that the ECB does not feel that this is at the moment uh, a big systemic issue given the size of CRE exposures, uh, but it's also reassuring that uh, they are doing exercises that uh, look into how the situation could get worse, either through uh, impairment of uh, broader financial markets or through combined uh, CRE and RRE exposures uh, leading to uh, stresses. So I'll make a few comments about the RRE uh, component of the papers. And the points that I make uh, are not intended as uh, criticism of the ECB papers, but more as my uh, feeling about where the literature is and where the policy uh, making community needs to uh, be thinking about uh, make, make, making uh, further progress. So uh, the three comments that I'll make are on the analytic toolkit, on the effectiveness of macro prudential tools, and on greater attention to housing supply and distributional issues. So uh, let me make some comments about the analytic toolkit that is used to assess vulnerabilities uh, at uh, sort of the major financial institutions, including the IMF, where I, I work for, for a number of years. Uh, a typical macro approach is to uh, model house price growth in terms of fundamentals like labor markets, as was stressed, interest rates, uh, population growth, and so on and then treat the residual growth as kind of a sign of overheating that needs to be tackled or tamed. Um, my own work, some of it done with Denise uh, about, uh, sort of a decade ago, um, uh, came to the realization that it's sort of difficult to establish uh, stable relationships between house price growth and fundamentals. Um, I think Denise and I found that the panel results often look good, but country by country estimation can be fairly challenging, uh, yielding sometimes even the wrong signs from the perspective of the theory, sometimes requiring uh, extensive digging to, to kind of get to a result that, that seems sensible. Uh, there are shifts in these relationships, there are non-linearities, some of which 
have been highlighted by these ECB authors themselves. Uh, for instance, the non-linearity non in relationships between interest rates uh, and house prices, uh, how when interest rates are very low, uh, the relationship can be quite different from when interest rates are in a normal range. Um, it's very difficult to measure uh, supply factors uh, driving house prices. Um, and in their uh, Journal of Economic Literature uh, survey, a very, a very comprehensive uh, and excellent survey, uh, Duca, Mühlbauer and Murphy pointed out that this approach of trying to explain house prices in terms of fundamentals and then using essentially the residuals as a measure of overheating or vulnerabilities had not had a great track record in actually predicting what would happen to house prices uh, in, in future years. Uh, they also pointed out some of the other difficulties that I have mentioned uh, above, including, for instance, finding it difficult to have good measures of the housing stock, which is a kind of a critical variable that one needs to uh, to make an empirical success of this of this approach. So um, I think this is a kind of a limitation that we have to keep working on. Um, we have to be aware that relationships are shifting and our measures of overvaluation or overheating may be really uh, way off the mark uh, at, at times. So I found it very useful that and reassuring that the ECB uh, has been supplementing this kind of macro approach that most many institutions use uh, with uh, a variety of micro data as was stressed in the presentation they are using loan level data to conduct sensitivity analysis of household resilience they are using uh, data on um, lending standards and new loans to see uh, whether uh, the quality of loans is deteriorating or not uh, my second point is on the effectiveness of macroprudential tools. So these tools have become kind of the first line of defense against overheating. Uh, they are used a lot as uh, the BIS and other IMF and other institutions have documented. Um, they are kind of tinkered with quite a bit by governments, uh, by policymakers these days. And it is true that the assessment of the effectiveness of these tools uh, has been growing. There's a growing literature that uh, provides data sets on the use of uh, these tools by countries. And there is a growing literature trying to assess um, how effective uh, these tools have been. Um, so, so this is a, you know, a, clearly a, a literature that is going to be delivering lots of results in the coming years but my feeling as a consumer of this research is that uh, the finding still seems to be that uh, macro prudential tools seem to take as one person put it to me uh, some of the froth off for a bit of time so they can kind of tame uh, overheating markets uh, for a little bit, but you have to keep tightening the tools if you really want to um, to have an effect. And the ECB sort of papers do acknowledge it when they talk about the significant challenges of limiting limiting the pace of accumulation of imbalances in housing markets uh, using these tools. So uh, to me, I think uh, we should be aware of the fact that we are increasingly using tools that perhaps will will work better over time or perhaps our assessment on, of how they are working will yield better results but uh, i think we should be aware that perhaps uh, we may need other tools uh, to help out um, you know in the past the bis and others have argued that there are complementarities between monetary and macro prudential policies so that you would need to, you ought to be using both in combination uh, when, uh, when, you're, when you're trying to uh, tame overheating markets during a boom phase. Uh, more recently, I get the feeling that the sentiment has, is more that you should leave monetary policy to focus on its 
output and inflation goals and use macroprudential policy for uh, for, uh, for for housing and, and uh, commercial real estate markets. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of Lars Svensson's work, uh, arguing that monetary and macroprudential policies are are different and separate. Uh, but I think we should uh, be open to thinking about whether we really need to be using these tools in combination rather than rely so, so exclusively as we seem to be doing now uh, on macroprudential policies. And my final uh, point is to stress the importance of, of housing supply, uh, particularly to tackle some, some distributional issues that I think are important. Um, so the question is whether we are really trying to fix what is inherently a supply issue with these short-term demand management tools, uh, the macroprudential policies. Um, you know, several studies, and increasingly when I was at the IMF, the IMF, I think, started coming to the realization and stressing the importance of supply constraints in driving house price appreciation. So uh, I remember a report on Canada that uh, was very influential and basically said that the problem in Canada was that they didn't have enough houses. Uh, that's a, a blog title that uh, the IMF put out. And I think similar reports were done for, for Germany, for the United Kingdom, uh, and so on. So I think that um, obviously the ECB is focused on financial stability issues, and uh, I don't want to uh, get into the issue of what its mandate is. Um, so, um, but I think uh, my point is not to look at these issues sort of solely from the lens of financial stability. Uh, it's, it makes sense for the ECB to be doing that, but for us as broader, as a broader community interested in these issues and for policymakers uh, at large, um, we need to step back and see, are we really addressing the problem uh, unless we are able to address uh, the importance of supply const uh, constraints? And I think expanding supply can help with uh, the distributional issues, namely that certain classes of borrowers like new home buyers or low income households are the ones that are uh, bearing the brunt of, of house price increases. And again, the ECB authors do acknowledge that. Uh, they do indeed acknowledge that there can be a tension between the pursuit of financial stability, which at times may require trying to prevent falls in house prices um, and the distributional impact that they have on younger and poorer households. Um, I'll end by showing some work that a co-author of mine, uh, Aziz Sundarji, uh, has been doing for the United States. So in this, for the United States, uh, what Aziz does is to um, show the burden of increased house prices or increased rents on different households based on their levels of income. So each of these lines that you're looking at represents a particular level of income. Um, the lines at the top are the low income. So the, the line at the very top is less than 20,000 US dollars uh, annual income. The line at the very bottom is greater than $75,000 annual income. And the left-hand panel is showing you the burden on, on house owners. The right hand is showing you the burden on, on renters. What you can see is that clearly the burden, first of all, is much higher for people in the lower income deciles. So very poor people and people in middle income, say in the twenty to $35,000 income range, are fairly cost burdened. Uh, a large share of their income, 30% or more, goes to meeting uh, their housing needs. And you can see that particularly for renters, this burden in the United States at least has been going up quite dramatically. So if you look at people in the income range of 
five to 45, uh, 49,000. You can see that gray line in the middle on the right uh, go up from about 30% of households all the way to about to over uh, to about 60% of households. So that's quite a dramatic uh, shift in, in cost burdened households. And I think that macro prudential policies are necessary from the financial stability perspective, but from shielding people from the burdens of, of meeting their housing needs uh, requires much more of a supply response. Here, you're looking at the same kind of chart that you were looking at before, except uh, shown by various counties uh, in the United States. So this is showing you where rent affordability is worse, uh, is the worst. So the, the darker, uh, the, the, the browner shades show you uh, counties in the United States where the, the burden is extreme or high and the blue and the white shades tell you where it's less of, a, less of an issue. So you can see that you know, along the coasts, particularly in California, among some of the poorer, even in California, there are poorer counties, among some of them, uh, the cost burdens are, are extremely high. Addressing the supply side of things, finding ways to make people not so worried about uh, the zoning regulations and uh, other considerations, though those are important, uh, may be a way of uh, addressing the housing affordability issue that uh, is one of the, uh, the, the purposes of, of this discussion today. So let me end by saying again that I found the ECB papers to be excellent and a very high quality work. Uh, it is really creditable that the ECB is devoting this sort of attention to monitoring risks in the uh, real estate markets, given what we know unfolded after the global financial crisis. Uh, I'm reassured that their assessment is that the risks to re uh, commercial real estate markets, at least at the moment, are contained, as Jan said, uh, on the residential real estate. As I've said, I think the work is, is, is very high quality, but I think the profession as a whole needs to uh, look at the analytic toolkit we've been using, supplement it as much as we can, as the ECB authors do with, with micro data. Uh, and we also need to think about whether our reliance on macro prudential tools is a bit excessive if the problems uh, indeed are coming more from uh, housing supply uh, considerations. So let me end there again, thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss these papers. Thank you. Many thanks, Prakash, also to bring in the U.S. perspective there. So let me give a chance to Barbara and then Jan, if, if you have any reactions. And then I have three questions uh, that came in from the audience that uh, I would like to pose to you. Thank you very much, Prakash, for this very clear presentation and also for your kind words uh, and also for the points that you raised. So I would say that all of them are very well received. Uh, so, starting with the overvaluations, uh, definitely uh, I am fully with you on that and also the, the past relationships that we can analyze. Of course, this is always a bit of a partial picture that we can really get. Uh, so, here I can just, just, just really say that I, I agree with everything that you said. As I also mentioned, especially in part of this, uh, this overvaluation, we try to use many models. We try to augment them also with many other tools. So we aim to be comprehensive in order to have several tools that can help us make our assessment. And if they all point in the same direction, it gives us some sense of confidence. But of course, uh, that is still with, with fully agreeing with, with your points. Um, then on uh, maybe I will drop to the third one now on more attention to housing supply and distributional issues. Uh, so I think, so again, fully with you on that, but I think you also um, said yourself, uh, what could be my response to this? Because uh, you actually said that for the ECB, the focus on financial stability is natural, given our mandate, but the profession as a whole needs to look wider. So indeed, this is uh, this is the reaction I would also have. So uh, as far as things like, so of course, um, the prices are, um, are, the, are a result of interplay of demand and supply. 
And so, of course, the supply is very relevant uh, and what is happening uh, on that front in your area countries, we monitor very closely. Um, we monitor other things too, uh, like, for example, the home ownership, home ownership or the, the other structural features of the market. But we rather treat them as a bit exogenous input into our analysis, because by definition, given our mandate, we don't really develop any recommendations in that, that direction. Um, but again, fully agree that uh, this is something that um, that is relevant. Uh, and then on the second point, uh, so macro tools, the effectiveness, and also whether monetary policy should help a bit more. Uh, then I don't know if I should discuss it that much or leave it maybe more for the policy discussion, uh, because that is also I understand something that we will touch upon a bit more. Uh, but here, uh, yes, also you raised many points that uh, would be my my automatic reaction to that. Then, okay, the question is whether monetary monetary policy should just focus on inflation, or whether they should have this dual mandate. Or maybe sometimes even like say three goals depending on the central bank whether they should also try to prevent crisis and then that is also something that would of course have implications for the toolkit and uh, for the mandates of the institutions uh, but that is in itself a very interesting discussion of course um, but maybe i stop there because i guess this is something we'll come back to uh, for sure in the points that will uh, that in the items that will uh, follow um, so i will hand over to jan if you want to add anything yeah, I mean, uh, just a few points to add. I mean, first of all, so thanks. Uh, as, as Barbara said, I think with many of the points you raised, we would agree. Maybe one point on the overvaluation. So, I mean, we fully acknowledge the, the uncertainty and that's why we use range of models. But I think there's also um, some reassuring aspects that I think are worthwhile mentioning. So we actually looked at the estimated overvaluation uh, before interest rates started to increase. And we uh, looked at the relationship with the realized house price adjustments that we have seen since then. And there's actually a striking negative uh, correlation. So the higher the estimated overvaluation three years ago, the bigger the price drop that we have actually seen since then. So while of course, I mean, this is just one piece of evidence. I mean, I think not all hope is lost. So I think at least qualitatively, these these um, overvaluation estimates can give some some um, indication in, in which direction the market is moving. But we're well aware of of the many caveats that come with these. Maybe one thing on macro pro, okay, will be discussed uh, in in detail later. But I mean, at the ECB, our view is by now the following: that for leaning against the wind, especially sort of credit booms and 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 real estate price booms. Uh, price yeah, that the capital measures will be probably not very effective in the upswing phase. So you would need to be very aggressive with raising capital requirements to really um, rein in uh, credit booms and and um, and house price booms. So our view is that potentially borrower based measures would be the much more effective tool because these tend to be quantity constraints instead of sort of price price constraints that indirectly come through the capital measures. But of course, here it's important to mention that ECB has no mandate when it comes to borrower based measures. And I think that's important to, to point out in the context of, of the euro area, because given our view that these would probably be also the more effective tools, this is fully in the hands of, of national authorities. Maybe one additional point on, on BBMs. Here, the lags are extremely long. The implementation lags we have observed. So when countries consider implementing borrow based measures, they're very long. Usually it's a lengthy political process to implement them. So in our view, by now we would say the most robust policy strategy for borrow based measures is really to implement them as structural backstop measures where you have a limit, let's say for an LTV or an LTI or LSTI, and you allow some exemptions above those limits. So let's say 5%, 10% of loan flows can be above the limits, but you cannot have unlimited uh, loan origination above these limits. And in our view, this is a very easy to implement and effective backstop. If you implement it in, in times where they're not binding, you're not cutting out anyone from the market and should at some point in the future, lending standards become excessively loose, they automatically constrain a bigger and bigger share of, let's say, the potential excess 
um, in, in the market. So in our view, this is actually a very, this is a robust uh, policy strategy to avoid that you're doing too little too late when it comes to, to these types of instruments. And then your yeah, housing supply I cannot agree more. It's, it's a big issue in, in many countries. It's uh, out, outside of the remit of, of a central bank, but it's very relevant um, in many countries. Well, we'll have a chance to also hear from OECD colleagues on, on that issue a bit more. So I look forward to that discussion too. Let me quickly, in the interest of time, let me quickly give the floor to John, who had a comment on this presentation. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, all, all this discussion has been really, really excellent. Prakash is, is, is spot on. Uh, let me just make what, um, well, two some more comments. Um, so one concerns the, the floating versus fixed rate distinction that, that you very wisely brought out in, in your ECB paper. Um, I think it's important to step back a bit and think about risks between, between the household sector and the financial sector. So depending upon whether you've got floating rates or fixed rates, you know, the risk sharing is very different. In, in a floating rate market, it's the household sector who bears the brunt of, of interest rate changes. Um, in a fixed rate market, that's, that's not the case. It, it's, it's the it's the underlying valuations of the of the mortgage book of the banks that, that potentially suffers. So that, that's an important point to make. And thinking about defaults, there are really two things that are going on, two possibilities. One is negative equity, and the, and the other one is stress on the on the DSTI. In other words, people having cash flow problems in servicing their, their debt when interest rates rise. And uh, it's really important to make that distinction because it, it helps you understand the heterogeneity between countries in, in, the, in, in the euro area that, that, you, that you focused on. And one, one final comment, I mean, Prakash is, is quite right um, to, to point to, to the limitations of things like the, the house price to income ratio as a measure of valuation. Um, my view is that we need a structural model that includes not just house prices, but also uh, mortgage lending and to focus not only on interest rates and housing supply and, and, and income, uh, but also on loan standards. And uh, you pointed out that um, you know, the boom since 2011 um, in, in the Euro area has been a combination of relaxed loan standards and, and lower low interest rates. So extracting uh, a measure of loan standards in, 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 this, in this kind of modeling would be very helpful in understanding risks to, to financial stability. Thank you, John. Barbara, Jan, any quick reactions? Under two minutes. Okay, under two minutes. Yes, so thank you very much. Very good points. And those are actually things that um, were cut out of my presentation for the interest of time. So thank you very much for raising them. So fully agree on this fixed versus floating. Uh, so maybe just one point that um, banks at least have some tools uh, to work with interest rate risk in contrast to households. Uh, but I fully agree with you what you said that it, in the end it's just a matter of who bears the interest rate risk. Uh, and then on the default negative equity versus uh, stress on that service burden. So the negative uh, defaults I cut out of the presentation because this is something that maybe is a bit more relevant for the US than for the euro area where we have full recourse lending and then banks would be still able to sue the borrower for the missing part. So that's why it was out of the presentation, but conceptually it's very relevant. So thank you very much for raising those points. And on a more structural model with lending standards for overvaluation, very interesting idea. So we have also more complicated uh, and more complex tools than just house price to income ratios, so model based, but they, they are still not perhaps as wide as what you suggested. Uh, so this is, uh, this is for sure interesting. So I'm going to suggest we move on. Ryan, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Denise. Uh, thanks, Ernst, uh, uh, for putting me on the program. Barbara and uh, Jan Hannes gave a uh, forward-looking thing. I'm going to give a bit of a backward-looking thing about uh, what's being used and then some of the lessons that, that policymakers can take going forward. And it's based on a CGFS uh, report uh, or called Macroprudential Policies to Mitigate Housing Market Risks. So just a bit of background so you can uh, uh, so you can uh, get a sense of what this report was trying to do and why, where, where, where you, know, uh, you know, so you sort of see why, why, uh, why we're looking in this particular way. The, the BAS's Committee on the Global Financial System, that's the CGFS, they set up a working group to examine macroprudential policies to mitigate housing, housing market risks. 
And the mandate of the group was to take stock of what we've learned on the effectiveness of using these instruments. Um, the group consisted of uh, members from central banks from 15 jurisdictions, of which Barbara was a member and uh, contributed a lot of great material. And this report tries to distill uh, the experience of using these macrobudential instruments and what you calculate from the start of the macrobudential instruments that we that we use, that we talk about in the report is 168 years, so about 10 years, just over 10 years of experience in on average across jurisdictions. Some have been much longer, some have been much less, of course. In this talk, I'm going to focus on what did we learn from using these policies? So what are the what can be best practice can be distilled from that? And what could help enhance policy making going forward? And some of these things are going to touch on some of the points that uh, Prakash actually mentioned in his in his um, in his in his uh, discussion. So, so the report, uh, you know, examines what how the what you know examines the frameworks that were used to set policy. This includes things like governance, a uh, set of number of operational aspects. Uh, tries to distill like here's like a how to guide and how you would do it. One of the most important things it looks at is a, bit, a part of how to set policy. What is your objective? And I think this is important to be clear about. And what it turns out is that this, over the macro prudential policies, they follow quite diverse objectives when we ask them, what do you follow? Um, and this really matters later on when we talk about what's an effective policy, because it's going to depend on what's your objective. So maintaining resilience of, uh, of lenders is the most common objective. And this overwhelmingly, uh, when, you, when we look at the, what the country has reported, result, uh, referred to bank resilience. There's also an, an additional uh, intermediate objective that's pursued, which is maintaining borrower resilience. Um, there are some important differences about what borrower resilience means between uh, or why they target it. So for some central, for some macro prudential authorities, they target borrower resilience because if borrowers don't default, then that helps maintain lender resilience. But for others, it's because when borrower resilience is, is, is put in jeopardy or is strained, then households can cut back on consumption. And then that can have aggregate demand externalities as they cut back consumption that spills through the rest of the economy and weakens uh, uh, and can then finally weaken financial stability. So resilience, like there's a lot of consensus on the resilience objectives. There's far less consensus on uh, on targeting um, cyclical intermediate objectives. In fact, only a handful of central banks said they did so. And if they did so, maybe it was a secondary objective. Um, this is kind of surprising in a way, if you think about much of the empirical literature on the effectiveness of macro financial policy, it is basically, does it affect cyclical variables? Does it affect credit growth? Does it affect house prices? And an enormous amount of literature has been spent on that, but it doesn't seem to be what central banks or macro financial authorities have actually targeting. Um, now, those that do, um, so one of the reasons to target cyclical uh, objectives such as dampening credit cycles is that it can, if you by doing so, by smoothing the real estate cycle, you can avoid the emergence of unsustainable relationships between credit and house prices. And that's one of the, one of the motivations for it. But actually, as an, as an intermediate objective, very few central banks or macroprudential authorities actually target that objective. Now, what tools to use? So this, this table summarizes two things, the tools that are, the types of tools that are used and, uh, and whether they are useful at meeting the, so the specific objectives that the central banks have. So let's look at the tools. There's, there's five of them here that I'm going to list. So the first one is perhaps slightly surprising. You, know, you don't often see this in, uh, in, 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 uh, in sort of in academic studies, supervisory expectations. Um, but it turns out to be one of the quite widely used, and particularly it's the first tool that is often turned to when thinking about macro prudential considerations of whether aggregate you know, ch changing credit are, are going to have macro kind of macroeconomic consequences uh, on the downturn. And so, of course, what's the most prominent example of, of supervisory expectations is, is almost certainly the stress test. That is, you do some sort of, you have a scenario of where things would go bad, and then it can either lead to actual um, asking banks to change their behavior on various aspects, or it could even be just publicized and banks are then, you know, by, by market pressure, by uh, uh, lead banks to change their behavior. 
Now, what has it been? And so, what, what does what do we what do the what does the, the the collective experience of the central banks in terms of the effectiveness of supervisory expectations look like? Well, it seems to be um, it seems to be that lender resilience uh, is 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 strongly uh, uh, impacted improved by supervisory expectations. So, stress tests do lead to uh, a set expectations about the the loss absorbing buffers that banks should hold and banks adjust accordingly. In terms of borrower resilience, they, they, they can work up to a point in terms of, okay, the, maybe the lending standards have declined a bit, but it still seems that it's, they're not taken as strongly. And what can happen after these supervisory guidance is set is that after a while they tend to, they can decline and requires a follow-up with some more quantitative measures, which we'll talk about below. And one of the useful things about cyclical expert, uh, supervisory expectations is that they can be flexibly dialed up or down in terms of meeting cyclical objectives. So some of the lags that you may have with having to agree about moving LTV limits or move, may changing capital ratios, with supervisor explaining, you can move those around relatively easily over the cycle if that is your objective. Now this turns to one of the most commonly, common uh, you know, borrower-based measures most commonly used is the LTV limit, the loan to value limits. Now, the analysis in the report suggests that uh, from the central banks is that lender resilience improves uh, is improved, particularly because by increasing an LTV limit, you improve, you improve the loss giving default rates uh, one, uh, 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 upon default. Now, there's a question mark about whether they actually help improve borrower resilience. So given the role of debt service uh, difficulties in being one of the key drivers of, of, uh, of borrowers defaulting in the first place, then it seems as if actually LTV limits are not very uh, successful in holding down debt service to income limits. And so it was con between the, the group within the report um, and looking at the uh, looking at what the, the views of central banks who contributed it, LTV limits are, not, are less effective in, in, in helping to maintain borrower resilience. They can be useful for some cyclical objectives. They do, uh, if you actively adjust them, you can dampen credit cycles. But in terms of uh, their effect on house prices, it's relatively small. And so while it can affect statistically affect house prices, it's not going to make much difference to their deviations from fundamentals. The other, the other very uh, widely used uh, um, borrower based measure are, are um, either debt to income or debt server to income limits. Um, now, these can, to some extent, uh, improve lender resilience because there's, there's some evidence from some countries that if you tighten, if you have an LTV limit and a debt to income limit or a debt service to income, limit, the debt to income limit tends to bite a bit more harder than the uh, LTV limit, and that tends to actually see improvement, uh, a reduction in LTV ratios just with the with the debt to these income based measures. What's very much more clear is that uh, income-based uh, limits are strongly associated with improving uh, uh, borrower resilience because of the close relationship between debt service and defaults. Uh, and I'll come into this a bit later in our presentation as they're also useful for cyclical objectives, but they actually do have certain properties uh, that help dampen uh, credit, credit growth or, or dampen credit cycles. Now, turning to capital-based measures, um, Capital-based measures sometimes in this macro prudential uh, literature gets a bad rap on uh, does it affect housing, you know, housing risks? Well, actually, you know, what is what is what is what are they trying to do? They're trying to add a macro prudential buffer to uh, to account for risks that are not that are not reflected in the micro prudential requirements. In that respect, but in terms of building buffers to absorb losses that are not incorporated in the micro prudential framework, then they do a good job in doing that, and if they're used for that. Uh, and calibrated appropriately. There's a lot of literature saying that there's no there's little little, little uh, um, uh, relationship between capital based measures and lending standards, and so you know in terms of debt to income, debt server to income, probably doesn't but you know the evidence suggests doesn't have much effect on borrower resilience, and neither does it have much effect on credit growth or credit cycles or house prices, and so little effect on cyclical objectives. And finally, there's a it's it's sort of like an, a side measure, but there is it is some tools that are used to think. Uh, that are that are used particularly when people when uh, when uh, macro venture authorities are worried about froth, froth from certain sectors and there's sort of a, a set of measures that are often targeted at specifically at investors and they can indeed raise borrower resilience so uh, of of the investor sector 
they have sort of mixed evidence about how effective they may be in dampening credit cycles. But the key takeaway I want to give from this slide is the following, is that really the effectiveness of the individual tool depends on the specific objectives. If you look at like what your objective is, where the ticks are, where the crosses are, they vary even quite a bit by tools. And I think that's something that is not, uh, hadn't ha it's not so widely appreciated in the wider, in the wider audience looking at macro potential policy. So I'm just going to give you a little flavor. There's a lot more in the report about some of the uh, uh, of like practical operational aspects. But I'm going to give you a little bit of flavor of that in these next couple of slides on how to calibrate tools, some of the distilled lessons. So there's a bunch of calibration methods that we, we distilled from the ways that uh, that, that, that uh, different macroprudential policies had set, had set their, uh, uh, calibrated their, 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 their various tools. Um, you know, two of the, so I'm going to start, I'm going to come back to these at the bottom, but often you see in studies of international benchmarking, stress testing, simulation models often fe feature quite a bit, but these tended to be more confirming the other types of stress strategies rather than being the ones that generated the strategy, you know, the calibration themselves. So what tended to gener generate the calibration themselves were things like, what was still, you know, let's, let's put, impose our standards early in the cycle. So what does that mean? It means that early in the cycle, uh, 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 lending standards and capital standards tend to be uh, prudent from the private sector side. Um, and by tightening them, by, by imposing them, by making them you know, aligned with lending standards or capital standards early in the cycle, that also helps in a sudden of, uh, avoid a sudden tightening of, of lending standards uh, uh, as well. One of the disadvantages, of course, is it requires consensus pretty early on in the cycle that that's good. That's a, it's a good time to impose them. Quite re related to the early in the cycle idea is benchmarking to a historical period. And that is, you may already be in a period of froth, but you can go back in time and a number of central uh, macro authorities went back and said, oh, there was a period when we thought lending standards were prudent. Let's go back and use those. And what's the advantage of that is that the lenders in that country are often familiar with with that standard because they were imposing them some they were they were, they were part of the of what they were doing some time ago uh, and then this is quite helpful because country there's a lot of heterogeneity in the structure of housing markets across countries and so sometimes across country looking at what's going on across country is not so useful but looking back in time in your own country so long as there haven't been structural changes is, is quite is quite uh, quite a useful way the third one is like a, is not to say, okay, we need to just make, you know, tighten standards today, but it's like, I want to say, I want to give a signal about uh, a, 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 I'm going to calibrate my, uh, my standards as a signal about where I don't want things to go in the future or limits to where standards are going to go in the future. And that's called this guardrail concept. And that's the idea is, Okay, I want to I want to calibrate my measure, but it's only going to bind in periods when there is high exuberance, and not and and so the idea is it's sending a forward-looking signal to lenders, uh, particularly lenders about where the limits are of the policy, and it avoids a sudden tightening today, but it does require some modelling assumptions. And the final sort of of the, of the four big ones that are, that are used as a gradual adjustments, and that is. You're uncertain about what the calibration should be, uh, so you gradually adjust your tool. It risks, uh, it avoids a, a sudden tightening or risk of overshooting the objective, but it's heavily reliant on expert judgment of when to stop. So it can be more useful, perhaps, for when you have cyclical objectives, this gradual adjustment, when you have structural ones, it's less clear about whether it's going to fit right. And so I really, you know, then I really did briefly discuss international benchmarking and, and, and uh, stress tests and model scenarios. Let me just give you a little flavour of some of some of the of the of the material on on calibration, international comparison of calibration of borrower base measures here in this in this chart. So the first thing is when you look about calibration of borrower base measures, it's 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 common across countries to differentiate the calibration by the type of borrower. So this first time buyers typically have less stringent uh, LTV limits or less stringent debt loan to income uh, uh, ratios than uh, second sub and subsequent buyers or buy to let investors. That's one thing is that this, and this is often done because the thought, the idea is that the, the feeling is that the costs of imposing uh, 
borrower-based measures are going to be likely to be largest on first-time buyers and less on second subsequent buyers and buy select investors. But there is quite a what you do notice also is that there is growing, there is more different, there is more heterogeneity across countries in their setting of measures for for buy to let investors and second and subsequent buyers compared to first time buyers. And one interesting thing that comes out from the from the work we did was one of the drivers of that difference is how it, it, it's it's whether you have a cyclical objective or not. Because often the the feeling is the view is that buy to let investors in particular are likely to be more cyclical in their activity. And if you want to dampen the cycle, well, why don't you better to target those where the costs are going to be lower than targeting activity of first time buyers? So that just gives you a little flavor. There's a lot more in the report about the practical nature of how things were done, but that's to give you a little flavor of, of, of what's in the, in the report. And, uh, so let's get to some of the bigger questions. Now, what influences policy effectiveness? And there are four, four conclusions that come from the report about the things that affect policy effectiveness. The first one is the availability of the best tool to meet the objective. So I already said that how effective a tool is depends on the objective. And so if you want to be effective, you should use the best tool to meet that specific objective. And they're not all, you know, it's not clear which tool. It depends on what you want to do in terms of what, uh, if you want to be effective. In this so one of the key constraints, and I'll come back to, I'll come to this later, is often, you know, there's often uh, a number of occasions where the macroprudential authority, or the one in charge, of, you know, who would like to make, the, who has the more, has the greater, has the more, more closest to a macroprudential objective, they don't have the legal or political backing for a specific tool, or the powers of directors are, are scattered across different agencies, and that other agency may not be, its main objective may not be macroprudential, uh, may not be a macroprudential objective, and so this has often resulted in on occasions of the macro prudential authority resorting to a second best tool. And so that's one of the things that weakens effectiveness. The second uh, element that weakens effectiveness is leakages. And a very, a very common, you know, well-known one long before, you know, before you know, as soon as macro prudential policy was, was, was came on, on the scene was, was leakages due to lenders being out of scope. A quite a common one uh, that one of the first ones that was kind of was, was, was flagged was cross-border leakages. In terms of mortgages, this seems to be largely an EU issue. Um, it seems as if foreign lenders aren't so keen to give uh, loans to other in to, to borrow households in other countries um, uh, outside the EU. Um, but there is still a case of there is still an issue of lenders be when lenders are out of scope, the financial uh, uh, vulnerabilities can migrate to non-bank lenders. And this particularly happens when you have activity-based regulation, so entity-based regula regulations of activity-based regulation. Um, uh, and so, you know, but, 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 but some countries do have entity-based regulation, there's that, that is they are the regulator of the banks and not of the non-banks. This can be particularly a problem when property developers are giving loans. So what, what, so what are some of, some of the very innovative things that have been done to mitigate the leakages is, is but given the centrality of banks in the in, in, in the financial system is just to request the supervised entities to terminate any relationships with non-compliant lenders. So it's saying you you bank, you if if a, if a property developer is giving a loan uh, that is uh, at a higher uh, uh, debt service ratio or, or, or a higher LTV than is in under our rules for the banks, um, okay, the banks have to terminate the relationship with them. And that can also go with non-banks. And given the close links between banks, non-banks as well, this can be quite a powerful tool. Another one is um, another common leakage uh, that, that it was exposed was extending loan maturities uh, to loosen D DSTI limits. So if you have amortization in a loan, if you, ex if you extend the maturity, you spread the amortization over a longer period of time, and that reduces uh, the, the, the debt service costs. Now that seems, is it a free lunch? No, because basically it takes the, how the household longer to accumulate equity over time. And it means they're in that vulnerable state for longer, particularly when they, when they the initial purchase before the equity is built up. So what have, what have macro prudential authorities done? They've done two things. The most common is to limit the, 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 the length of the loan maturity. And this is quite interesting now, given some, in some countries, loan maturity is extended quite a bit, given the rise in interest rates. 
Um, and but another one, a more kind of innovative one, actually, is to say, OK, you have a long loan maturity. The risk is coming from not having enough housing equity or taking time to build up housing equity. Why don't we just uh, why don't you just we just put a, lo a lower LTV limit on those long maturity loans? So let me turn to the third one in the interest of time, which is a, a, a that affects effect is a lags, and they've already been discussed already. Um, so there are decision making lags. That's the, often the need for consensus when there is a committee, uh, particularly when there needs to be a consensus decision rather than a majority decision in order to implement the measure. Uh, there can be decision making lags not just because you need consensus, because because of the uncertainty of uh, you know are you, is, are the risks far away from our objective or are they are, are we going to miss our objective or not? It's very hard to measure these things over in, in real time. Um, so there can be decision making lags. Then there are implementation lags. They're subtly different. I'll often there may be a decision to uh, implement a, 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 a particularly a, a um, borrower based measure, but also capital based measures. But there are often rule, uh, uh, requirements that the macro venture authority has to do a consultation, particularly when they tighten it. And this can often then this leads to another lag, and this actually leads to some asymmetry in the choices of uh, of, of, of macro venture authorities. Of if I can't tighten now, do I loosen now? Uh, do I, if, if it's harder to tighten in the future, do I loosen now or not? Finally, there are lags in the materialization of the desired result, which is exactly what. Uh, uh, Barbara and uh, mentioned earlier uh, in the ECB presentation is that often the flow based measures, while people say they may be more effective in certain respects, they take time to, to for before that flow based measure builds through to a, a safer stock. And so capital based measures here uh, can be implemented and, uh, and acted on much faster and can be uh, can can deal with some of those issues if that's. If that's and the fourth one. That affect the first, the fourth factor that affects effectiveness is the automatic stabilizer properties of the tool. And I think this is something that is, I think it's new that we are relatively new that we're bringing in this report and trying to highlight. And it's particularly a place where more work can be done. So what is the idea of an automatic stabilizer? We know that from fiscal policy. They they tighten and loosen without the need to recalibrate policies, just like taxes do. So there are some tools that we identify in the report that have good automatic stabilizer properties. One is a debt to income limit. Incomes tend to be less cyclical than house prices. And so as house prices rise and demand for credit rises, because incomes are less cyclical, if put, it's already dampening the cycle. Similarly, if house prices tend to fall, incomes are less cyclical, then they would again start to ease, you know, in terms of easing the, the constraint, and it has an automatic stabilizer property. Some debt service to income rate limits also have those properties, though not all. But one of them is say you know, is one with a, a fixed interest rate floor or a fixed stress interest rate. So the idea is that if, if, if interest rates fall by a lot, then there is a fixed floor at which this debt service is calculated against. Um, and that means that it, you know, when in, in a boom that limits the amount that can be can be lent uh, or borrowed. Uh, but then as, as interest rates are high, uh, you know, the, the floor doesn't bind. Uh, and the actual the actual debt service to income ratio often is the thing. So it has some automatic stabilizer properties too. And you can then certainly, if you want to then think some, a few handful of countries then, you know, use that, not use that logic, but they've also have made risk, to, risk weights dependent on DTIs. And then so you could get some automatic stabilizer properties also built into the capital frameworks as well. And something I wanted to really highlight is just that, that, that there are other tools that really need active adjustment to, to remain to remain effective. And the LTV is one of the clearest. It's, we've already just talked about our house prices above fundamentals and not by to what degree. So if house prices rise significantly from, uh, from fundamentals, the LTV remaining at the fixed level is not going to give you the same protection as it did before the house prices rose. To the lender. And so LTVs really need to be moved aggressively as if you if house price if you want to give the same level of buffers to banks if house prices move far from fundamentals. And similarly, some and then another one is potentially, though it's a bit less clear, because it depends on how it's implemented, are internal ratings-based risk weights. So if you've gone a long time in a country without a crisis or without a housing downturn, risk weights can slowly edge down. 
And so in order to remember, keep your risk weights at uh, you know, the, the, your capital uh, levels commensurate with the risks, you may need to actively adjust to add another buffer. Up. So they're the four, four things that affect effectiveness. So let me turn to the policy lessons we can then take away from some of these things. So we have four policy lessons uh, that we have in, in, in the report. The first one goes straight to uh, Prakash's uh, is, is, is discussion, and that is macro prudential measures are not the only tool in town. Tax planning and land supply policies all have a big impact on the demand and supply imbalance in housing markets. And it's the demand and often the demand supply imbalance, which then leads to, it's one of the triggers that ignites the, any to the, sort of the, the, the spiral between credit house prices and, and risks. <clears throat> and so let me just give you a little a picture. We, we collected a little bit of data um, just to give you a sense of like how important these, these things are. Is this, this little chart here, it just shows the change in dwellings per capita over the past decade and the change in house price to income growth over the, I mean, and the house price to income growth over the past decade. And basically where supply had increased, house prices hadn't risen much relative to income and where they had actually decreased, uh, they had risen the most. And so these are kind of fundamental, this is a, shows just how powerful they are. There's also a good discussion in the report about ta tax. You know, tax is particularly useful when you have speculative activity by, uh, by investors, small scale investors as well. And so uh, successful mitigation of boom bust cycles or of mitigating uh, risks uh, from housing markets requires consistency across housing related policies. The second lesson from the report is that governance frameworks influence policy effectiveness. So I already discussed that infected, in, effectiveness is impaired by not having the best tool for the objective, by leakages and lags. And governance frictions are very often at the root of these problems. So we try and distill the aspects of good governance into these seven principles by looking about what worked across countries in, in who contributed to the studies. Let me pick out a few. The first one, it seems to be that one, it's, it, uh, that, uh, that one body who is ultimately accountable for financial stability helps to uh, Im uh, improve the effectiveness of policy. So one, there, are, there are different models you can follow though. What does this mean? So one of them is like the UK's Financial Policy Committee, it's the sole responsible, sole entity responsible for safeguarding financial stability. Uh, and the other one is actually the potentially another one we, we, we talk about is the front is uh, uh, HCSF, the High Council on Financial Stability. And that's, uh, that's a little bit different in that it also includes the finance minister in it, but it's still one body and that body itself is responsible for safeguarding financial stability. So second part, I want another one to mention is that having a clear legal basis to introduce tools that address all sorts of risk. So I said, already that not having the best tool to meet the, the objective you want to follow is, is, is a big constraint on being effective. And so one of the examples of where, where, this, where this, is, this is clear is in Ireland, for example, where the central bank has broad regulating, regulation powers through which it introduced mortgage-based measures. And so having a clear legal basis and to, to introduce the tools and often, uh, it's, it's often been the, the income-based borrower-based measures that have been held up for other reasons for political reasons and because the macro prudential authority hasn't had the clear legal basis or backing to introduce those tools. The third one is operational independence. Um, so what in, what in New Zealand, for example, we found very useful, they only had an LTV policy. The government hadn't until very recently given them an income-based tool. Uh, and because they needed to, 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 to be remain effective to move this, move the LTV tool regularly or along with the cycle, their operational offense, effect, uh, independence helped facilitate their regular, regular policy recalibrations. And finally, the one I'll, the last one I'll highlight from the principles is it's having a mechanism for the macro prudential authority to recommend actions from fiscal housing or monetary authorities. And I think this is missing in many, many, in, in many frameworks. And so one of the examples that is very interesting is, is, is the case of Singapore here, where in order to deal with the risks in the housing market, there were also changes by in stamp duty by the tax authority and also increases in land supply by the land supply authority. And what they do is they think they get together basically and then try and work out where their common interests are between these three authorities. And, uh, and that helps them sort of flag 
where there are conflicting. So having a formal mechanism to do this, is, it, it would be a very useful part of, a, of, a, of an effective governance frame. We also have, a, so governance you can't change overnight. <laughs> We really appreciate that. And so, you know, what, what's been done, what practical things have been done to smooth the edges of existing governance frameworks? So thinking about the problem with the LANCs, uh, both implemented, both uh, in decision-making, but also implementation is, is, okay, take some time to implement the policy, but central banks or macro regulatory authorities have actually implemented measures early through non-binding recommendations. So it's already before the, 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 the process has gone through. You say, okay, well, this is a non-binding recommendation, but we recommend you do this. Yep. And then that's been effective of plugging the, the, the gap and mitigating the lags. Another one I'm going to go into is to use tools that, that can help meet uh, objectives without requiring adjustment. I'll come back to that in a moment. So once another issue is that political economy is influencing policy, particularly when you have these groups where the finance minister sits on, on, on the, on, on the, on the, on the macroprudential authority decision-making body. So one of the, one very interesting innovation in France is that the power to innovate, to initiate a measure rests with the central bank. Uh, and so it's, if, you, if, you, if you say you can make the power to initiate in rest with the, 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 the authority who has, whose main objective is financial stability, then they are only, those things are only gonna come on the table at the point that they matter. But, for the, at the point that they're really considered for macro prudential reasons and not for other reasons, political or, or, or otherwise. Yeah? Another thing that seems to have worked well is to include external academics on these panels. They help bring in an outside, ex, outside perspective. And they often sort of can bring the, you know, this, this disagree, the different views, different people to, to, to come to a consensus. And you can't escape political considerations. It's just one of those things that seem to be very, very hard to do with macro prudential policies targeting house prices. But if they do exist and you can't escape them, better to write them down in, uh, explicitly. And so it's clear where it's clear why this is why the why the why what something's happening. And so then if it helps with the communication and it and assigns accountability to why if things you know why things are happening and it could give things go wrong. And finally another one is that the desired rule tool hasn't been granted legal backing. Well it doesn't stop you from doing something, and uh, macro prudential authority often supervises, and so you can use supervisory expectations as, as, a, as a key mechanism. And it's just been done very, very successfully in Belgium with their comply and explain mechanisms, which we highlight in the report. The third lesson is is uh, from our, 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 our uh, from this report is that tools that meet objectives without requiring adjustment are, are especially effective. So we, in, in, in action advice is an ever-present challenge uh, for a bunch of reasons. It can also be for good reasons that we don't quite understand the risks and so on. So let's try and have tools that have better automatic stabilizer adjustments. So that's DTIs and DSTIs instead of LTVs. Um, with capital-based tools, include things like flaws on risk weights. So you don't, if, if they're in periods when risk rates are falling a lot, you don't have to even adjust anything, make an actual active policy decision to change something. And I think here is more of a, there's some examples, but there's a scope, there's a lot of scope to think more carefully about tool design so that you can have these, these, these tools designed so that they can automatically meet uh, objectives without additional actions that need to be taken. And the final lesson is just about it's about being openness about the costs and benefits of, of, of macro prudential policies. So there is a, just a very big problem in that the, uh, the benefits of macro prudential policies are, are largely invisible. If we don't have a crisis, you don't see, you don't see, the, you don't see it. Uh, and they're dispersed. Many people benefit from not having a crisis, while the short term costs are more visible and they're borne by a specific minority and those who are wanting to get on the property that way. So, yeah. And so, one thing that seems to have been have worked well in central, in certain central banks and macro prudential authorities in dealing with this this challenge is just being transparent about the costs and benefits. Uh, you can't escape that. You can't escape that there is a trade off. Be transparent about it, and the public can gain some. You can foster help foster long term support from the public for the measures. Um, a few macro prudential authorities now try to assess. And communicate their macroprudential stance within cost-benefit frameworks. 
um, in, in, in some, some way of going towards this to say that there are a cluster of benefits and here's why we're doing. But these cost benefit frameworks are still nascent, still grow. And so one thing we want to do in this report is just highlight the need to develop these frameworks. Uh, if you have these frameworks, well-developed frameworks that people agree on, this is actually a way of ensuring operational independence of macroprudential authority, because then they can accumulate clearly why they're doing it and what the costs and the benefits are. And so this is really, but we're still in a long way to go, and we'd like to use the report as a signal to the academic community. Think hard and help us uh, in terms of building these cost-benefit frameworks. So with that, I'm going to conclude with a, a, a link to the report. And to remind you that there are some, the, the, the report is actually based on a, a series of case, country case studies. There's a lot of very, very interesting information about the experiences learned uh, from different countries. There's a lot of heterogeneity here as well, um, the, between emerging markets and uh, advanced economies and, as well. So I really recommend that you take a look at these reports. I very much look forward to your questions and the discussion. Thanks, Ryan. It's a wealth of information, so many nuggets. Uh, so I look forward to Nina's discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. My name is Nina Bdanovska. I'm an economist in the research department of the Monetary, International Monetary Fund. Uh, so I'd like to start today by thanking the organizers for putting together such an insightful panel on a very important topic. So it is my pleasure to participate and discuss the findings uh, from this very clear and well-executed report on macroprudential policies to mitigate housing uh, market risk that Ryan just presented. I would like to cover four main points. So first, um, I will summarize the main findings of the reports uh, of the report, highlighting the main lessons that I learned uh, by reading it. Uh, second, I'd like to talk about um, a few observations that I gathered while reading uh, the report. Um, uh, third, uh, I will take a step back and it will offer some suggestions, areas that I thought uh, policymakers could focus their attention to. Uh, and finally, I will also discuss some of the recent uh, work uh, that uh, we have been uh, doing uh, here at the fund. One of the first uh, lessons of the report is that macroprudential poli uh, policies complement other macro policies, such as tax uh, and land supply policies, and in particular for strengthening financial um, Resilience. Second, um, the report highlights that governance uh, frameworks are important, uh, suggesting that uh, single authorities, uh, clear legal and analytical framework and operational independence is what works best in practice for the effectiveness of macroprudential uh, policies. Third, uh, which was very interesting um, and that I learned about is that some tools are more effective for borrowers, uh, such as uh, debt to income ratios, while others uh, are more effective uh, for uh, lenders, such as loan to value uh, ratios. Ryan uh, did an uh, amazing job presenting the report and also uh, I think uh, the analysis uh, that are within the report are as excellent, rich, uh, and uh, also uh, they go uh, uh, in that. Uh, so, uh, but while reading uh, the report, I, I had a few observations uh, and um, you can think of them more as uh, items on a wish list uh, rather than a critique uh, uh, of the excellent work uh, that has been done here. So the first uh, thing that I wanted to uh, highlight uh, uh, was that um, I was wondering about uh, how effectiveness is uh, assessed. So uh, more specifically, uh, because uh, these analysis, of course, are done across countries. Uh, and um, but what I was thinking is that uh, what is the exact variables um, uh, that um, uh, that are the target one? So are we looking solely uh, at credit growth uh, or uh, credit to GDP gaps, or are we considering uh, also more broadly uh, mortgage defaults, the financial health of lenders and borrowers for house purchases, uh, or uh, lower volatility in housing markets, or is it a combination of all of these? Um, target variables uh, and um, and potentially some others that I might be overlooking uh, at, at the moment. So I thought uh, that um, the clarity uh, and consistency across different countries uh, when we talk about the effectiveness uh, on what is the key variables that we are targeting is, is really important uh, to uh, highlight. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make uh, was uh, about uh, existing research uh, on on the effectiveness of uh, on of of these macroprudential policy tools on on housing markets. So existing research 
uh, from both uh, academia and uh, colleagues here at the, uh, at the fund suggest that macroprudential policies have more subdued uh, impact on house prices uh, than on mortgage borrowing. So, as anticipating more novel analysis uh, on, on this question in the report and ideally employing micro level uh, data. Uh, given that the report topic uh, uh, is uh, the, the uh, how macroprudential policies can help with the with the housing uh, sector, such in depth analysis, I, I thought could shed more light uh, on how these tools affect not only borrowing but also asset values, and uh, that could provide a, a more comprehensive view uh, of uh, of the outcomes. And the last uh, point that I had uh, was uh, actually. Um, the importance uh, of the interaction between macroprudential policies and monetary uh, uh, policy. Uh, so one uh, could obviously think that when these two policies uh, uh, interact or they are tightened uh, at the same uh, time, uh, the effects on credit uh, might be uh, stronger. But another possible outcome is that uh, if the stance of monetary policy is already tight, uh, macroprudential uh, macro policies may be less effective. So while the report considers other macro policy that Ryan just described, such as the tax and land supply policies, I thought uh, that a discussion on monetary policy um, uh, would be an important uh, uh, to, to add. Okay, so now um, let's take, let me take a step back uh, and consider more broadly areas that have been less examined uh, um, in general, uh, not, not necessarily related to the report, but uh, in general uh, in, in the policy um, uh, arena as well as um, in terms of academic uh, research, as well as data that I thought uh, could benefit both uh, policymakers uh, and researchers. So, uh, to better understand uh, actually the effectiveness of macroprudential policies, um, I think we need more uh, micro level uh, data analysis. And this is so because of several reasons. So, first, uh, this approach uh, not only helps uh, with the, the uh, identification, but it also allows for a deeper um, analysis of how these policies impact target variables going beyond the average effects. So, second, uh, this granularity also helps uh, understand the impact uh, of these tools across the distribution of borrowers and lenders, enabling us to pinpoint specific characteristics that drive different outcomes. For example, uh, we can investigate whether low-income uh, households are disproportionately affected by certain macroprudential measures, or if small firms face more challenges uh, when it comes to obtaining credit when certain macroprudential policies are tightened. So, in a recent uh, uh, paper with a colleague here uh, at the fund, we have been using micro level data and actually we find that the effectiveness of macroprudential tools can vary significantly uh, depending on the income distribution. In particular, what we find is that lender based macroprudential policies, such as the minimum capital uh, requirements, uh, tend to restrict credit more for low income uh, borrowers compared to high income borrowers. Whereas other macroprudential policy tools, such as the tax uh, on financial institutions, uh, uh, turn out to have stronger or more pronounced effects to high income uh, borrowers compared to low income borrowers. A key insight from this analysis uh, essentially is the importance of understanding the distributional effects uh, of macroprudential policies. And why is this so? Because recognizing and addressing this distributional income is essential for not only designing effective policies, but also to designing more equitable policies. The second point that I had on data is in terms of uh, improving um, uh, our under, uh, understanding uh, of the uh, effects of macroprudential uh, policies. We also need more detailed data uh, on uh, macroprudential uh, uh, tools uh, when, uh, and to record when they change. So, while uh, there are indeed uh, excellent comprehensive uh, data sets that are covering a broad range uh, of uh, countries uh, and time periods, these data sets uh, document policy changes using only binary outcomes. 
but the magnitude of the change remains an important uh, issue. And while such metrics exist for certain tools, such as the loan to value ratios, and for a smaller uh, into a smaller uh, set of countries that debt to income uh, ratios, uh, such um, macro prudential uh, uh, such uh, data sets uh, are, are not uh, and metrics uh, are not uh, available for a wider set uh, of uh, macro prudential policy uh, tools. So now turning uh, to uh, the policy questions and consideration that I thought arise uh, from, from this context. So um, as I mentioned uh, in, uh, just now, uh, existing work has documented that macroprudential policies uh, have distributional effects, and this is not only limited to borrower-based measures, but also to lender-based uh, measures uh, as our recent work uh, uh, shows. Then the natural question uh, for policymakers is how to deal with the distributional effects. So what are the welfare costs of a singular, not tailored to a distribution macroprudential policy? For example, thinking about the LTV or the DTI ratios. Uh, and this is a question that with colleagues of mine, we have been thinking about and working um, uh, over the past uh, year. Uh, the report also highlights that one option uh, to, to tackle these distributional effects is to use uh, fiscal uh, policies. But another option uh, is also to tailor uh, the calibration of, of these macroprudential uh, tools to the distribution. However, this remains an open question for both researchers uh, and policy um, makers, and I, and I think many of us don't, don't have the, the answer now. So before I conclude my discussion, um, let me say a few words about ongoing uh, work uh, here at the fund. And I think uh, this speaks to some extent to the questions that um, uh, Barbara and Jan uh, raised uh, during the first uh, uh, presentation. So the most um, recent monetary policy tightening episode uh, has been unprecedented uh, in breadth and in synchronicity and has left many uh, to wonder why some countries, but not all, continue to have robust growth and also house prices uh, have pulled up. The data that we have looked at uh, suggests that there is a significant, uh, there are significant differences in terms of housing markets uh, across countries. And what I mean by this is that mortgage market characteristics differ significantly across countries in terms of loan maturities, fixation periods. This was also already discussed uh, in the first presentation and also lending uh, standards. But in addition to these differences in mortgage market characteristics, there is also uh, significant differences in housing markets and in particular local housing markets because housing markets are essentially local. And then uh, the regions within a given country differ significantly because some regions tend to be sub more supply constrained than others. And also some regions in some countries could uh, have more hot housing markets compared to um, other regions. So then the question is, uh, how do these differences uh, across and within countries play out for a transmission of monetary policy? So these differences uh, across countries is important also to know that although they, uh, they seem to be more structural in nature, they also change over time. And then the question is also how that impacts the transmission uh, of uh, monetary policy. So we address this uh, and uh, some uh, other questions in our forthcoming April 2024 uh, WIO Chapter 2, uh, which will be published uh, during the week uh, of uh, 8 to 12 of uh, April. Uh, and I encourage everybody to take a look because uh, I, I think uh, it, uh, it will comprise a very uh, interesting set of analysis. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for the time uh, and your attention, uh, and I look forward uh, to uh, the discussion that will follow. Thanks, Nina. Ryan, let me give you a chance for quick responses. Uh, sorry, I, I think I've got four, four, come and cut to four points that you had. They were very helpful. Um, so firstly, is like the big question is what is effectiveness? Yeah, and that's something that we we struggled with in this report, and then we realized that. Effectiveness depends on what your objective is. So, as I said earlier, credit growth or house, affecting house prices may not be your objective. And so, are you effective if, if that doesn't change? Um, 
Uh, but, but I think when you're measuring effectiveness, given that lender resilience is at the core of many measures of effectiveness, then what you said is right, is that defaults at some level are, 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 are at the heart of this, in a sense that it's our losses in, so the, the, the best measure is our losses in a downturn um, in line with the buffers that you had in place. Yeah, and that would be the best measure of effectiveness, but we haven't really had a cycle yet. Uh, only a couple of countries in our in our in our um, in our group had 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 these policies over more than one cycle, and so that is a real limit. Um, generally, how central banks measure effectiveness, the first thing they do, we have a little box on that if you're interested in it in the report, which is uh, it's just a direct effect of the policy on the on the measure. So if you say it's a DTI of uh, uh, of three or a DSTI of uh, 30 35 percent. You know, is there is there compliance with it? That is the first first way. Um, then there are things like indirect effects that they're like kind of nice to have. If you have a in put, a, put a, like an LTV and affects house price growth, that's great, but doesn't mean effectiveness and so on. But there's a box on it. I don't want to go too too much on that. Um, in terms of the housing slowdown on asset values, uh, uh, yeah, I think this is a the report we we didn't. This is this is just to be open about it about. What, how policy should be set in the downturn? That is an open question. But given that many of the many of the macro authorities only have a resilience objective, or that is their main objective, and smoothing the downturn beyond the effect that it's going to affect lender resilience, you wouldn't expect many much movement actually uh, in in policy setting. Um, and then the third one is the interaction between uh, macro approved monetary policy. Um, uh, this is kind of we did we had actually the discussion within the group, but it's it's there seems to be some question about whether there is internalization of the effect of monetary policy on macro pro and vice versa. That typically happened where the central bank and the macro financial authority were in a in in one country or closely knit. Whereas in the euro area, there seems to be kind of like a separation between between the two. Whereas so like in Australia. You know, given that they know that monetary policy is being tightened, then there's a sense of okay, we all dampen our macro pro setting and, and so on. Um, and finally, this is the point on micro data. I mean, this is this is a key one in that the central banks have realised that they need to the micro data to assess the effectiveness, to assess all these different angles, and there have been major, major efforts by central banks to improve their their data collection in order to be able to assess those. And then in terms of distribution aspects, some things I didn't mention, but flexibility margins, speed limits, all those kind of things are an important part of dealing with allowing the market to deal with distribution or some of the costs, and which include distributional things. So that flexibility margin is allowing some set, some fraction of loans to be exempt from the borrower base measures and they let the market decide. And the other one is they're kind of useful also for like regional difference. So you talked about regional difference in in, in house prices in terms of monetary policy, but these flexibility margins are also useful to deal with the fact that often in capital cities, prices are higher and that allows banks some, some leeway to, 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 to adjust accordingly. But thanks for the discussion, Fred. Thanks, Ryan. John, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really thrilled that the IMF is uh, focusing so much on heterogeneity. So I've been plugging away on heterogeneity for more than 25 years. Um, but it, it does raise some questions in my mind. Um, so, for example, you know, I mean, all this cross country work, the, the big panel studies of 60, 57 countries, whatever, on the effectiveness of tools. I mean, not only is there this, this problem of the zero one as opposed to um, more sensitive measures, but there's also the, the importance of institutional differences. Because, you know, if you have, um, for example, you have uh, equity withdrawal available in some countries, not in others. Um, if you have floating rate interest rates in one country, not in others, that changes the, the risk profile, it changes the transmission mechanism, it changes the possibility of amplification and so on. So, yeah, I really worry that, that trying to draw broad conclusions from 57 countries without taking into account this amazing heterogeneity that we have could lead to misleading conclusions. So, for example, the, the conclusion that that uh, there's more of an effect on on credit flows than on well, credit dynamics than on house price dynamics um, from from tools. Well, you know, if you can't measure the fundamentals correctly, how do you know? 
because the impact on house prices without controlling for, for the fundamentals could be, uh, could be biased. And so you can't be quite so sure about that conclusion. I just want to raise that as, as, as an issue um, because it's something that I think one needs more subtle work on. But thank you everybody for this absolutely fantastic, these fantastic presentations. I, I just love the CGSF report. I think it's so good. Um, it really should be read by everybody in, in this in this area. Thanks, John. I couldn't agree agree more. So let me now turn to the OECD presentation. Uh, we have Boris, Sarah, and Volker with us. I guess Boris, you will kick it off. Hello, um, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this invitation. It's really been uh, fascinating to uh, follow the presentations and the discussion. Uh, we um, are going to. Um, present in uh, two steps. Uh, first, um, uh, Volker Zimann and myself uh, with um, a few messages uh, from a report uh, we published a few months ago, Brick by Brick 2, and uh, then uh, Sarah Perret, who is uh, going uh, to bring uh, the conclusions uh, of a large OECD report on uh, the taxation of housing in uh, OECD uh, countries. So here, um, uh, just uh, to um, echo the conversations uh, that uh, took place uh, before, uh, highlight again how strongly house prices uh, increased uh, across uh, OECD countries and uh, with uh, Austria, since uh, yeah, we um, are hosted uh, today uh, virtually uh, um, in uh, Austria, being no exception. On the contrary, with that uh, uh, very, very strong increase and the end uh, recent correction, which was uh, particularly uh, marked uh, in uh, Austria, this is measured in uh, real terms. So we are really in uh, lively times uh, for housing markets. So. This uh, is to remind the way at the OECD we've uh, approached the housing sector over the past six years with a broad effort where uh, we uh, looked um, at uh, the ways in which policy interventions in the area of housing have uh, implications for the efficiency of the sector, uh, the capacity to supply housing, which is really at the core of the efficiency of the sector and which, uh, I mean, as, uh, has been uh, eloquently uh, discussed uh, throughout the seminar, is uh, sorely lacking uh, across OECD countries and has been so for decades with the problems we have now in terms of uh, housing crisis, the lack of uh, affordability that is widespread across the income distribution premium spectrum and particularly marked for low and uh, middle income households uh, in uh, the great majority of OECD countries. But together, looking at the effects of policy interventions on inclusiveness and environmental sustainability. That has been so since the outset as a way of identifying the policies that uh, bring progress across multiple dimensions, as well as so of documenting uh, the trade-offs that arise uh, across uh, these objectives. Uh, as is very often uh, the case uh, when uh, progress is made uh, in uh, one direction. And uh, this um, was the case in the main uh, report, Brick by Brick, uh, that was uh, published in 2021. And uh, we continued uh, the work with uh, focus on the burning uh, topics uh, of the day, being um, housing uh, finance, uh, the ways in which uh, housing demand has evolved following uh, the onset of COVID, digitization and the rise of remote work, and uh, Volker is going to tell more about that, and uh, the decarbonization of housing, about which I'm going uh, to um, give our core uh, messages, as uh, this uh, is a key plank of uh, overall efforts for OECD countries to uh, achieve meaningful progress towards uh, the objective of net zero carbon emissions by uh, 2050. The um, 
The starting point here is to highlight uh, how important it is to uh, take care of the housing sector. It is uh, really a central sector when it comes uh, to reducing uh, CO2 emissions. Just the fuels that are burned in homes um, uh, make up 12% uh, of total emission. Uh, for instance, if we think about uh, global aviation, which is uh, raising uh, very often quite a lot of uh, uh, passion, this is only 3% of total emissions. So just the fuels in homes, it's 12%. And then the fuels that are burnt to generate electricity that is consumed in homes, it's another 11% plus then the share of um, homes in uh, the emissions of construction activity, which are 6%, since housing is about two thirds of construction, we can add another 4% uh, for uh, housing uh, here. And when we look to 2050, this on the right hand side is a global um, uh, set of uh, figures, we see that uh, the demographic growth plus income growth and as a result of income people who want more space is going to uh, generate demand for uh, more housing space more heating more cooling as well and uh, so that uh, it's not only the decarbonization of the current uh, housing needs that has to take place but also of the future ones and this has to um, uh, come in uh, the projections that are prepared uh, in, uh, by the IEA, which are summarized here, by uh, very aggressive electrification of homes, which then means uh, full decarbonization of the power generation uh, sector and a lot of improvement in the energy efficiency of homes so that uh, uh, the primary energy needs are uh, reduced. Is this achievable uh, without uh, crazy assumptions, I would say, about uh, uh, just accepting uh, lower temperatures uh, in the winter or higher uh, temperatures uh, in the summer. If we look across countries, uh, we really can get uh, hopes um, from uh, uh, the situation. There are uh, countries that um, have strong energy needs in uh, homes, uh, very often because of geographical uh, conditions. Look at uh, Norway, uh, Sweden uh, on this uh, chart to the very right uh, of the chart. If you look at the bullet uh, points here in black, these uh, countries have strong uh, energy consumption in homes even though they have energy efficient homes, but uh, yeah, it's cold uh, up there in the north. And, but they have very low emissions. Why? Because the homes are electrified and electricity is generated uh, without uh, carbon. Well, in, in the case of these countries with uh, hydro, but uh, um, if you look across uh, this chart, you will see other countries with, that have this decoupling, which also use uh, other uh, sources. But then you also have countries that use a lot of energy and emit a lot of CO2. If you look to the left here of the chart, you have the United States with um, high energy use, uh, which is with a lot of um, combustion of fossil fuels in homes, plus uh, a lot of uh, carbon emissions uh, in the production of the electricity that is used in homes that the light blue bar here on the left. So this uh, is uh, just here uh, a memorandum uh, item. This is essentially what I uh, said uh, before that, uh, yeah, the mix of uh, fuels, uh, including in energy generation is very important and that there is considerable heterogeneity across uh, OECD countries. So a lot to learn from the ones that have decarbonized their energy mixes in homes uh, and in power uh, generation. And then if we look not across countries, but over time, again, this is backward looking in the past, the past 20 years, where there has been a lot of reductions in housing emissions, it's been mostly through a reduction in carbon intensity of the energy that is used, much less by a reduction in the energy use per capita. So this is important to keep in mind when going forward as well with the electrification being a key plank of decarbonization strategies. Here uh, you see going from the top to the bottom, the 
energy mixes that uh, are uh, in, required uh, in uh, the International Energy Agency scenarios to 2050, where you see electricity, which is plotted in green here, uh, really taking over, and um, natural uh, gas, oil, and obviously coal uh, really having to uh, uh, being uh, eliminated from the mix. How to get there in terms of policies? I'm going to go very quickly over uh, this one uh, because it's a, it, it's a tax chart. Uh, mostly, these are the effective carbon rates which are calculated uh, by uh, our um, uh, colleagues from the Center for Tax Policy and Administration. So, Sarah uh, will be in position to say more and also by the Environment Directorate. But the only thing I want to say here is that what matters not to look only at carbon taxes, but to look at all the taxes that generate effective uh, rates on carbon and uh, that uh, there are some countries that uh, apply uh, pretty high uh, carbon rates on uh, the carbon emissions from homes, but many where uh, these effective rates are uh, extremely low. So here, there is an obvious um, policy space. Uh, the action has to happen in places where carbon rates uh, are low, because if you don't have a pricing of uh, carbon uh, emissions, then all the other forms of action you can have lose a lot of their effectiveness. You have uh, emissions uh, that come back or you have subsidies uh, that are very difficult to use, regulation that uh, fail to bite if they are not well aligned with uh, the pricing system. And uh, it is difficult to decarbonize uh, buildings here. This is very rough to do these estimates of marginal abatement costs. Uh, but still, um, uh, when they are done, uh, almost universally, they show that uh, uh, the building sector is one of the most uh, uh, difficult to decarbonize uh, in terms of the cost it takes uh, to eliminate um, one ton of uh, CO2 emission at uh, the margin. And so to do that, there is a need for pricing, as I mentioned. Pricing is not enough because there are uh, a lot of uh, parts of the building uh, sector that are not directly attained uh, by pricing. Uh, if you think of uh, tenants uh, in uh, apartments that are rented out, social uh, housing tenants, people uh, who uh, live without pay. And there are a lot of people who don't have uh, economic incentives uh, to decarbonize, even if there is pricing. So there is a need for uh, regulation uh, as well. There is a need for subsidies to avoid the very severe social hardship that uh, can come from unmitigated uh, pricing. There is a need also of adapting uh, laws that regulate the relationships between landlords and uh, tenants so that uh, the economic uh, benefits uh, of the electrification and the insulation of homes these uh, benefits essentially flow to tenants when the costs are paid by landlords. So there is a case for making sure that rental contracts can be adjusted so that uh, the tenants who will pay less in energy can also be invited to contribute to the costs. And there is also a case for uh, ensuring that in uh, um, the financial sector, there are the means to have good quality information on the energy performance of homes so that uh, lenders and then uh, buyers and sellers of property backed uh, um, uh, of property backed loans can have good quality information about uh, the buildings uh, so as a way of rewarding in the financial system lending to green buildings and to have something about really the performance of buildings not just a green label which can have very different meanings across countries uh, depending on what is called green and on this i um, give the floor to my uh, colleague uh, Volker Simon. Yes, hello. Uh, thanks, Boris, for this per first part that uh, takes actually a bigger part of the presentation than, than my uh, my part, uh, which is a bit counterintuitive, because what you will see is that um, this section draws a lot or goes very much uh, into the core business of, of housing policies to the extent that uh, 
it uh, looks at the match of supply and demand. And what we were actually looking at uh, in this in this report is uh, the Im impact, the effect of COVID, uh, mostly on demand and obviously also on supply and prices. So the starting point was to uh, observe that uh, teleworking has expanded in, in, in many countries during the confinement and the early uh, measures, but also uh, thereafter. Uh, I mean, it's quite visible because we are here on a hybrid meeting. Before COVID, probably we would have met uh, in Vienna or in some other place. Um, so we all see that uh, there's a long lasting impact of, uh, of teleworking, which uh, enables or which opens a trade off now um, for, for many workers as they can, if folks can click on the slide. So we have agreed that I don't manage the slide because uh, you won't, don't want to interrupt. The presentation. So what you can see here on the right hand side is actually um, a, a modularization that we have uh, done for for this uh, work on the Paris region. And the idea of this uh, of these areas that you can see here is that before COVID, uh, if there was kind of a capacity uh, uh, or yes, um, um, a capacity that people attach in time in time capacity and um, uh, for commuting. Uh, so if this was uh, five times a week uh, traveling thirty minutes one way. If you use the same capacity and you only have to go to the office now three times a week, people could say like, okay, if it's a bit further away, but it only I only have to go there three times a week, maybe I can work, I can travel for 50 minutes. So basically it's five times 30 equals three times 50. Uh, so in a sense, um, this would uh, then mean that people would accept uh, commuting a bit longer and less often, less often, and that opens up uh, a new area for, for uh, potential residential areas, basically around the city center of Paris. And that's what you can see in the dark blue area. So I think we have all heard uh, anecdotes about this uh, among our friends, and maybe maybe even yourself, you moved uh, out of, uh, the, of the city center. Um, so what we can see here, or what, what this means then to demand is that demand shifts to the outskirts. And as a result, um, as you can see on the next slide, is, is on the left-hand side, we have observed the prices uh, before the pandemic. So the darker it gets, the more expensive it is. Um, so this is uh, the case in most uh, uh, monocentric cities. Paris is a, is a formidable example of a, of a monocentric city, I would say. So the, the highest price is observed in the, in the city center and it goes lighter, uh, lighter right the further you get out. And what you can see on the right hand side here is the price change between 2019 and 2021. So you can see that the outskirts have actually observed or experienced um, steeper price increases than uh, the city center. And this is something people call the flattening of the curve that you can see on the next slide. So this uh, uh, curve represents the, um, the price gradient. We call it the price, uh, urban price gradient. So the further you go away uh, from the city center, so on the left hand side, it's the city center, zero uh, distance to the density cluster, uh, to the, to, yeah, to the uh, center. Uh, and to the right hand side, it goes up to 50 kilometers. Here's just a stylized example. It's the average of, uh, of um, large metropolitan areas that we have used across 16 countries in, in our database. And what you can see is in 2019, uh, so this was uh, quite steep in the city center. And then as a result in 2021, uh, it became flatter, mainly because in the city center, uh, price increases were not as steep as before. And in the outskirts, you can say, you can see also it increased a, a bit further. So all these numbers are um, the difference to the, uh, to the average uh, of, uh, well, of the uh, metropolitan area. So what this means in terms of policies, and that's why I mentioned at the beginning that this brings us actually to the core business of, of policies, is that when demand shifts like it has to, uh, it had, it had, it's actually perfect, um, yeah, experience, uh, experiment actually on on how to to make sure that supply is adjusting accordingly. So usually uh, you only have to adjust supply at the margin. So here uh, many cities have experienced a big shock basically to to, to demand shifts due to demand shifts and that um, uh, yeah, forces them basically to adjust supply accordingly, which as we have seen in prices did not happen immediately. Uh, so you have seen stark price increases in areas that now faced uh, higher demand. 
So the first uh, policy we often look at is uh, yeah, land use and special planning, which is a core uh, thing to, to adjust basically. And in many uh, areas, countries, we see that there's a lot of fragmentation and especially when you get um, further to the outskirts of uh, large uh, metropolitan areas, there are um, other municipalities involved and they have their own um, agenda, their own uh, special plans. So harmonizing this and bringing the governance of land use and, and special planning to a higher level, to the metropolitan or regional level, is one of the of the key issues here, and that, that faces obviously political headwinds, and it's difficult to implement. The next one is the reform of rental regulation, so finding a more balanced uh, um, uh, balanced regulations that protects uh, tenants, but not overly disincentivize investment on the on the landlord landlord side. Um, the same we have seen in many countries that uh, many countries uh, use uh, transaction taxes uh, excessively, which is a burden on mobility and uh, disincentivizes uh, yeah, mobility and uh, kind of a new acquisition of uh, of, um, of dwellings. So we argue that there's a case for a a shifting from transaction taxes to recurrent uh, property taxes. Uh, we also saw in many areas, maybe not in Paris, but I heard anecdotes in Berlin. For example, in Germany, that there is a problem uh, that uh, yeah, uh, outskirts are not as uh, as well connected in terms of fiber internet and so on uh, with, than the city centers. So some people think twice actually of moving moving out if they think that uh, from from the outskirts they could not could not work remotely as efficiently as they could in the city center. So this is an issue in some countries. Um, uh, the next one is. Uh, to prevent speculation that uh, ties into the first policy on land use and special planning. So there's a lot of fragmentation and not in my backyard um, um, behavior on, 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 on uh, municipalities and, and localities. And one way uh, to yeah, avoid this is, is uh, preventing uh, speculation by, uh, by using, um, using the, the, the tools that uh, governments have at hand. Uh, and finally, one of the policies that we found uh, very effective in providing additional supply is uh, social housing, uh, especially uh, when you think of um, uh, avoiding segregation. So, uh, in many areas, um, one of the main problem problems is, uh, again, fragmentation that uh, not in my backyard behavior um, prevent uh, this from happening in, uh, in, in the outskirts. So uh, national housing funds here can, can, can help a lot. So the nat national policies play a big role uh, in setting up, for example, revolving funds, like it's done in, in Austria successfully in, in, in Vienna, for example. And we, we see that uh, many countries look uh, to Austria and to Vienna specifically and, and try to, to, to learn from, from the uh, experience, uh, experiences in Austria to set up these uh, revolving funds and also to crowd in private investors uh, in, in these social housings with financing mechanisms that are safe, safe, sustainable to avoid um, continuing inflows from public money. So I think this is a, this is a key idea too. And with this, um, I would give uh, the floor to our colleague, uh, Sarah. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, this invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you today. And I will be briefly presenting the key findings from a report on housing taxation that we released a couple of years ago. So um, the report actually starts with an overview of housing market challenges, but I think this was very nicely covered by my colleagues. And so we'll just uh, jump to what we cover in the second uh, chapter of the report, which focuses on um, distribution of housing wealth, which is of course um, a key consideration when we're talking housing tax policies. So this, uh, first slide here shows the importance of housing for households in general and in particular us. So in OECD countries, owner occupied housing accounts for about 50% of total household wealth across all households um, and for more than 60% of um, middle class wealth. So if you take um, the second, the third and the fourth quintile on the graph. You also see, if you look at the right-hand side of the chart, that owner-occupied housing as a share of total wealth is significantly smaller at the top of the distribution, um, where households hold a larger proportion of their wealth in uh, financial assets. 
So it's key for households and for the middle class, but if we look at um, the distribution of the overall stock of housing, we actually see that it's heavily concentrated among wealthier households. Um, so this figure shows that uh, on average across countries, about half of total owner-occupied housing wealth is held by households in the top wealth quintile. And we see that secondary real estate, so non-owner-occupied um, real estate, is even more concentrated at the top with roughly 75% of total um, secondary real estate being in the hands of people in the top wealth quintile. Um, in general, as well, housing wealth is disproportionately held by older households, um, and this is what these graphs show, um, and it's true for owner-occupied housing as well as for secondary real estate. In the report, we're also interested in the evolution in, uh, of, of homeownership rates um, and what it shows, at least in the countries that we've managed to get uh, data for is that home ownership rates have declined over successive generations in a number of countries. So basically, um, in here you see Australia, Southern Europe, the UK, and the US. And so it shows that for um, these countries, each generation is generally less likely to own their homes at a given age than the previous generation. And of course, this is not very surprising given um, the very strong growth in house prices that countries have been experiencing. This was just some background. The core focus of the report is really on housing taxes in the OECD and looking at current issues, but also suggesting some options for um, reform. So in general, if we look at the taxation of housing in OECD countries, we see that um, there is a wide range of taxes that are uh, levied on housing. There are taxes on the acquisition of housing, so transaction taxes on housing purchases, VAT on sales of new properties, there's a range of taxes on the holding of real estate, the main one being uh, recurrent taxes on removable property or what we call the property tax. There might also be income taxes in most countries, uh, typically taxing rental income. There might be mortgage interest relief. Um, and then there are a few countries that tax either overall real estate wealth or overall net wealth, including um, housing assets. And then you may have taxes on the disposal of housing assets, either capital gains taxes, if housing assets are sold, or um, inheritance estate and gift taxes if um, housing is, is gifted or inherited. But at the same time, so a wide range of taxes on housing, but at the same time, a key message uh, from, from the report is that housing, in particular owner-occupied housing, often benefits from preferential tax treatment and sometimes highly preferential tax treatment. Um, the most common forms of uh, tax reliefs for owner-occupied housing include capital gains tax exemptions, uh, mortgage interest relief, and at the same time, the non-taxation of uh, imputed rents. And there might also be, depending on countries, additional incentives like reduced transaction taxes for first-time buyers. And as a result of that, in some countries, owner-occupied housing ends up being significantly undertaxed compared um, to other assets. And that ends up distorting the allocation of savings. Um, it tends to be regressive, given what I just showed the, the distribution of housing assets, and it also reduces the revenue potential of housing taxes. In addition to that, um, the, the highly preferential tax treatment of housing might have counterproductive effects by making housing a more attractive investment. It can actually lead to higher uh, house prices when housing supply is relatively fixed. So that's mostly for owner-occupied housing. Uh, when it comes to secondary housing, Preferential tax treatment tends to be less widely available, but it is available under different forms in some OECD countries, nonetheless. So the report um, looks at the different taxes that are levied on housing, and then it tries to identify a range of options to uh, reform housing. And um, I've just selected a few areas for the purpose of this presentation. You can, if you're interested, have a look at, at the report, but I just selected some areas here, starting with um, 
property taxes. So um, the report um, uh, highlights the fact that recurrent property taxes have been consistently found to be one of the most economically, form economically efficient forms of taxation, mainly because of the immobility of the tax base um, and the more limited behavioral reactions to property taxes compared to other taxes. If we look at the distributional, oops, sorry, this is very sensitive. <laughs> um, if we look at uh, the distributional effects of property taxes, they tend to be regressive with respect to income, but that will depend across countries and uh, depending on well. Um, a key finding from our report is that many countries still rely on very outdated property values for their property taxes, and that ends up significantly reducing the equity, the efficiency, and the revenue potential of property taxes. Um, so that's really a, a key message in the report. And then the, the report also um, acknowledges the potential liquidity issues that may arise with property taxes, in particular for income poor but asset rich households. So, based on the assessments, we um, have a variety of reform options. The main one being uh, ensuring that property taxes are based on regularly updated market values. That's actually a prerequisite for a well functioning and fair property tax. Um, we advise against the use of features like value bans, tax caps, and assessment limits. These are provisions that generally aim to lower uh, uh, property tax burdens or prevent a big jump in uh, property tax burdens, but they do so in regressive ways. We discuss as well uh, using progressive tax rates um, to enhance the equity of property taxes. It's an option, but we point out that progressivity is usually better achieved by higher level levels of government than by local government. And then we stress the need for provisions like tax deferral or payments and installments uh, to address liquidity issues. So that's for property taxes. Um, this is just a graph illustrating the disconnect between uh, the increase in um, house prices and the much lower increase in property tax revenues. And this is largely uh, explained by the fact that um, uh, countries rely on outdated property values for their property taxes. The second big category of, um, of uh, tax that we look at is transaction taxes. Um, and the report highlights the distortions from transaction taxes and, you know, the direct effects on housing markets and the indirect effects on labor markets. Um, in general, the empirical evidence suggests that transaction taxes have a stronger impact on housing markets and local residential mobility than on longer distance moves and, and labor mobility. Um, so there are some distortions, but at the same time, or on the other hand, um, and this was mentioned uh, in a previous presentation, transaction taxes can also be used specifically for the purpose of curbing house price growth and speculation. But actually, if we look at the empirical findings on this, there tends to be mixed evidence as to whether this is an effective tool. We also, um, in the report, highlight the, the pro-cyclical nature of transaction tax revenues and the fact that this can lead to revenue shortfalls in economic downturns. Um, so, in terms of our main messages from the report is that uh, transaction tax rates should be reduced, especially uh, where they're high. But that should be done as part of a package of reforms, and in particular, a package that may increase uh, recurrent taxes on immovable property, so property taxes. Because if, if you just cut transaction tax rates, what you'll end up doing is just providing a windfall gain for current homeowners. So this is what Volcker was suggesting, a shift from transaction taxes to property taxes. Um, in terms of addressing um, house price growth and volatility, uh, the use of transaction taxes should be carefully assessed against policy alternatives that may be more effective. Um, we also look into, I'm just mindful of the time, but I'll go quickly. Um, we also go into uh, a, dis a discussion of capital gains taxes on housing. Um, a key observation is that a majority of OECD countries completely exempt capital gains uh, uh, on the sale of a main residence. 
And there might be some justification for exempting a portion of capital gains on under occupied housing. Uh, in particular, to prevent lock in effects. So, the disincentive that people may have to sell their house if there is a capital gains tax, uh, but also to simplify tax administration. But at the same time, of course, a capital gains tax exemption will distort uh, savings and investment decisions, will be very costly for governments, and may ultimately contribute to increasing house prices. Um, and of course, as well, capital gains tax exemptions for main residences disproportionately benefit those at the top of the income and the wealth distribution. So, one option for reform would be to tax capital gains on main residences above a certain threshold. Um, and that threshold could be set at a relatively high level of gains to make sure that um, they primarily target the wealthiest households and continue exempting those homeowners. For uh, gains on any other property other than owner occupied, uh, capital gains should just be taxed fully to promote neutrality among different asset classes. And where capital gains are taxed, countries should consider taxing real rather than nominal capital gains, which is what some countries. And mortgage interest relief um, in general, um, our report concludes that uh, countries could consider limiting or phasing out mortgage interest relief on owner occupied housing. Um, for uh, conceptual reasons, but also empirically, because mortgage interest relief is found to be ineffective at raising home ownership, is found to also encourage household indebtedness, and is regressive in the sense that it provides greater benefits to households. However, it's very important to take into consideration um, the uh, the need to avoid destabilizing housing markets uh, when countries are considering these kinds of reforms and to carefully time these reforms. Um, and this is probably something that we want to emphasize in the very uncertain uh, current environment that we're in. Um, we also touch upon a whole other, um, well, a whole range of areas um, in the tax policy space, um, and those are some of our additional messages. Um, in general, tax policies to encourage home ownership might lead to increases in house prices if supply is relatively fixed, so it might not be that effective. Um, we also look at tax incentives for energy efficient housing and find that in many cases, uh, there's a disproportionate uptake of these measures by higher income households, so there should be better targeting of these measures towards low income households. Um, we find mixed evidence on the impact of recurrent taxes on vacant homes, so we highlight the importance of design there uh, and the need for additional research in this area. And we also uh, stress, stress the need to uh, continue addressing housing tax avoidance and evasion, whether it's sort of small scale, um, domestic scale. Uh, tax avoidance and evasion, or much more sophisticated forms of evasion, including offshore tax evasion. Um, so that brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Without any delay, John, the floor, floor is yours. Right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm in the an embarrassing situation of praising uh, to the skies um, everything that's been said and what's written in these two reports, which are absolutely fantastic. Um, they're so lucid, they're comprehensive, well-researched, evidence-based, reference-based. Of course, land and housing are so intimately involved in all aspects of economic life that um, if these recommendations were um, were actually implemented by policymakers, the well-being of citizens and life on Earth could improve greatly. Um, I don't need to say what what was in these uh, volumes because that's been so well expressed by the presenters. Um, one comment I have is that perhaps the role of land is, which is certainly implicit in, in everything that, that, that's written here, um, maybe is a little underplayed. So I think much of the rise in real estate prices actually reflects rocketing land values. And uh, there's been some serious work on the implications of of these kinds of booms um, for productivity, um, for financial risk, and um, and growth prospects. So you know, here are some of the some of the papers. Miller and Werner, wonderful paper that looks at panel data on sector allocation of credit. Um, over a long time period, and then a whole bunch of other papers for a range of countries. That, that show 
but um, boosting growth of sectors with low productivity growth is one of the consequences, crowding out credit access to non real estate sectors and increasing crisis risks are all aspects, negative aspects of, 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 the, of these developments. Um, so, um, just looking at the role of land, um, you know, here are data from the OCD balance sheets, household balance sheets. Um, and what they show is that the share of land in um, non financial um, assets. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, the UK is the star um, in the UK, the, that's the top line, the dotted blue line at the top. Um, more than 70% of the average value of a UK house is in the land rather than in the building. Uh, other countries are not quite so bad, but almost everywhere, apart from Italy and, and Japan, there's been a quite a substantial increase in, in the share of land in, in, in valuations. Um, both reports confirm that well-designed recurrent property taxes could have a whole range of, of benefits. Um, you know, broadening the tax base, raising more tax revenue, given the fiscal crisis many countries now face, um, reducing inequality of all kinds, reducing greenhouse emissions, um, improve land value capture to finance infrastructure and affordable housing. I think that that's something maybe slightly underplayed, um, but it's certainly land value capture is something that uh, the, the, the two brick by brick reports have uh, have said quite a lot about. Um, reducing urban sprawl, allocate the existing housing stock more efficiently. Um, and therefore improving affordability. And of course, labor market flexibility, um, Sarah has just pointed to how important the reduction in transactions taxes is for that. Um, widening, reverse the widening of regional inequality and stabilizing the macro economy. But I think maybe that could have been a bit more emphasis on, on these long-term issues of shifting investment incentives away from rent seeking to productivity enhancing. So land value taxes, um, which the report certainly discusses at, at some length, um, have long been regarded as the most efficient. Um, but much of the literature, the Georgist literature, and even some of the um, more recent general equilibrium literature, um, doesn't focus on, on what the optimal tax literature says, which highlights the need for a consumption tax, um, as, as the Modish report made clear. And you know this literature, almost universally seem to ignore the greatest market failure that, that mankind faces, you know, the life threatening emissions of greenhouse gases, as, as Boris um, so eloquently explained. Um, together, I think these, need, these imply a need for split rate taxes in which land and buildings face different tax rates. And um, it's important to take into account um, the, you know, the, the carbon emissions um, implied by buildings. So at the moment, market value based property taxes actually discourage green investment because you know, if you invest in, in improved insulation, the value of your house goes up and you pay more tax. I mean, that, that is a discouragement of, of low, low carbon emission. So at the very least, this justifies a discount for low carbon emitting buildings. And you know, in the absence of comprehensive carbon taxes, these discounts need to be quite substantial. And in effect, they're a polite way of, of saying we need to tax high carbon em emitting buildings more, more highly. So I've uh, written a paper for the OECD um, in a volume that came out uh, uh, late autumn um, on what I call the green land value tax, which is a split rate property tax uh, of this kind. Um, well, the reasons, the reasons for, for thinking about it um, fit so well with the, the whole agenda of, of the two brick by brick and, and, the, and the taxation volume. Um, so as, as I said, it, it's a split rate tax with, with a tax on the charge, with a charge on the land and a charge on the building minus a discount that, depend, that depends on, on carbon emissions or energy usage um, as an approximation. Um, Regular revaluations, of course, are absolutely essential. And as Sarah said, deferral um, is, is important to protect cash poor but land rich households. 
So deferral is something that I've thought a lot about. Um, it's a key element for public acceptance. Um, and in this proposal, at least every retired household would have the right to defer the tax um, to protect cash poor but probably rich households. And the way it would work is an equity based system where the tax authority registers a proportionate interest at the land registry equal to the unpaid tax for each year deferred. And that's settled when the property is sold or transferred. And a small discount for cash payments to protect the, the revenue flows of the tax authority. Now, research on where deferral schemes have been widely offered in different countries in the US, Canada, and so on, show that take up has been remarkably low. And the research suggests that eligibility restrictions, ignorance, complexity, concern about high interest rates, and downside risk to, to house prices are possible reasons. So in contrast to existing deferral schemes, the proportion of equity is very easy to understand. Um, you know, deferring household just to tick, tick a box on the property tax form requesting deferral without a means test, without complex form filling, compound interest calculations, and so on. Um, to stabilize flows, national governments would probably have to underwrite deferral schemes at local levels. And I think eventually one could roll out the deferral right to, to all households um, after it's in, become uh, embedded and tried out. So in, in the uh, tax report, um, there's quite a lot on the distributional impact of uh, recurrent taxes on the move of a property. And here's a quote you know, from page 80 to 81 in the, um, in the report. Now, my comment on this is that most of these studies are on cash income and are confined to owner occupiers. And that leaves out something really important, a very important part of what the national accounts include in the definition of consumption and disposable income, uh, namely imputed rent. And once you've got deferral, this problem of, of the cash flow imbalance, the liquidity effect that Sarah was talking about, disappears. There's no excuse then to focus just on cash income inequality, no excuse for omitting tenants. So to make it obvious, a cash poor widow owning a house in an expensive location is actually pretty well off compared to a tenant with the same cash income and paying rent. So this matters a lot for the analysis of split rate taxation, where land is taxed more highly than buildings. And this, this study by Barbosa and, and Skipka um, is really the first, I think, that looks at really granular data. It does so for German owner occupiers. And it finds that land ownership is more concentrated than property ownership. But land values are slightly less correlated with cash income. And so they conclude that among owner occupiers, a shift from a property tax to a pure land value tax would create somewhat more losers than winners in the lower um, income quintiles. And once you include disposable income, that just cannot be true. And then once you include renters, typically in less spacious homes, you know, it's very obvious that exactly the opposite conclusion holds and that um, a shift towards land value um, is actually highly um, progressive. Um, discussion of valuation. I mean, there's a very good discussion of um, valuation issues in the OCD report. And of course, Germany has just, just gone through a revaluation exercise um, showing that it can be done in practice. Um, and here's a quote on, on Australia where um, mass appraisal techniques have been used uh, very sensibly to do that. And let me just make the point that, that uh, Actually, there are now very clever methods, superior hedonic mass valuation measures, uh, which have been developed by Dewitt and colleagues and, and others that um, do a very good job of identifying uh, the different factors that drive valuation. Um, here I've, I've summarized how it works, but um, given that time is running out, um, let me just say some things about the UK, because the UK, I think, is probably the world champion in this housing market dysfunctionality. Um, and applying these ideas from the OCD to the UK makes me think of a three part policy package. First of all, to enable land value capture, planning reform, and then replacing the council tax, which is a barbaric tax that we have um, with something more sensible. 
Um, I mean, this is the council tax that uh, exists in the UK, which is individually regressive. On the left hand side, you can see that the people in in um, in the lower value bands pay a much higher fraction relative to the value of their homes in tax compared to the higher value bands. So band A is the lowest value band, and H is the highest value band. And regionally, it's also regressive, very strongly regressive. So quite dysfunctional. So what I'm proposing for the UK is um, to expand the coverage of property tax to agricultural and vacant land, um, invest in the land registry to improve uh, coverage of land titles, also something as the report um, points out, um, reduce stamp duty, again, very much in line with the OCD, um, and start with a property revaluation, um, enabling a move to a proportional property tax with green discounts and equity based deferral, also needs to be phased in, uh, and so on. Um, and finally, um, split land values from building values at the next revaluation, probably not something you would do at the first revaluation because these things need to be planned carefully and of course the whole thing needs to be phased in over time uh, a point very much uh, focused on by by the OCD uh, housing report so this I think is very much in line with the overall conclusions of, of, of these these three um, fantastic uh, uh, books that the OCD has produced and I'm hoping that and at some point, policymakers will start paying attention to what the OCD has been saying for some years now. Thank you. Thank you, John. Also giving us the practical roadmap on how to implement these principles, I guess. So, under one minute, Sarah, Boris, Walker. Thank you very much uh, for the comments. I can only uh, applaud and uh, emphasize uh, what you said on the role of land. Yes, absolutely. And there is something um, that uh, governments could uh, do. It's really to work on supply, to uh, facilitate supply as a way of reducing this value of land, which uh, is really uh, the reflection. It's really a scarcity rent that is happening in, uh, in land value that is uh, boosted by the accumulation of layers of regulation after regulation. And so by uh, allowing, uh, by allowing uh, uh, greater use, including uh, by uh, giving uh, powers to uh, the metropolitan level, as uh, Volker mentioned, there, there are indications that uh, this, uh, there are very few examples of this being done. Uh, one, uh, uh, we are uh, following is something that's happening in Victoria, in Australia, where uh, there were serious uh, shortages and they are considering a move uh, in this uh, direction. So it will be interesting to see uh, what is uh, happening uh, there as this gets implemented. So it's Volker. Thanks, Boris. Welcome. Yes, just um, thanks a lot for this fascinating discussion, uh, John. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed by how much praise we, we always get from you. and. It also uh, is a bit uh, mind-boggling when we think of how, how much we agree actually on the measures we have to take, and which makes me wondering why it doesn't happen. <laughs> and I'm just coming back from a country which I don't want to name, and uh, all the policymakers, all the politicians, all the stakeholders agree with the catalogue of recommendations that we give, but tell us at the same time why it cannot happen. So I, want, I wonder, for example, uh, things you mentioned about winners and losers. I think this is a key dimension. If you think of property taxation, including in Germany, I think that the goal of the government is to make this budgetary neutral, which by definition then means that some have, will lose and some will, will gain, right, from the, from the reform, like in Western, Eastern and Western Germany. So then from a political economy point of view, we know that this is unfeasible. And uh, the only alternative would be that um, public money, money will be spent, so the deficit will increase. So this is one of the bottlenecks we see in, in, uh, in reality. And the other one is, um, which I mentioned a bit in my presentation, fragmentation. So if you think about the, the levels of government that are involved in housing policies, it is in most countries so complex and fragmentation just opens the door so much to this not in my backyard kind of um, behavior, including on land speculation, because if you think of public land that is often in the hands of municipalities, 
they themselves speculate on it. They themselves don't want to lease or give it below market values to social housing providers because they have a political gain to, to, to lose there. So I think um, it, it's always fun and exciting to, to talk between us and to agree on the measures. But I think at some point we, we have to break this uh, the, the, the silo basically that we are sitting in basically. And I mean, you, you probably talked to UK government as well. I mean, you have been a proponent of these measures for longer than we at the UCD. We only started working on, on, on this catalog basically five years ago, including based on your uh, research. So what what is your take on how can we actually pro propel uh, actual reform and not just research? Well, let me let me just praise uh, the report one, one more time, because in, in, the, in the report, there's a very interesting discussion of, of Denmark. So one of the great things about this kind of research is, is the, compar the comparisons you make between countries and the lessons you can learn, because the, the richness of, of experience across the world is so huge that there's a huge amount to be learned. And, and the Danish experience of property tax reform is really quite positive. So they, they brought in a, a progressive property tax. Um, it's phased in sensibly. They seem to have got political agreement um, pretty much across the spectrum for it. And you know they've recognised that it has quite important stability implications for for, for the for the economy. So you know if if the Danes politically can do it, um, maybe it's possible in other countries as well. Maybe we stop at that relatively positive note. I'm going to say I'm not going to take more than one minute. Uh, just very quick and imperfect summary. We started with Barbara telling us uh, lately. Recession remarks are looking okay, but labor market strength is a key factor behind that. And what's next? We need to be watching, which Jan also emphasized on the commercial estate side that uh, activity is down, prices are down, vacancies are up, MPLs are coming up, so we need to keep an eye there. And Prakash reminded us we shouldn't leave affordability and distribution issues, inequality out of that equation, and we have to improve our tool on how we assess vulnerabilities. Then Ryan reminded us about how we should think about automatic stabilizers, the role that they can play and the importance of being transparent, communicating with uh, what uh, we're trying to achieve as, as financial supervisors and policymakers. Nina complimented that by asking for more micro level analysis, call for more research there. And then Boris, uh, my note was reducing emissions from housing is gonna be expensive. And Walker complimented by saying, well, supply also needs to adjust to new ways of working. And Sarah, uh, of course, um, brought in the tax reforms are going to be needed to face these challenges. And John, uh, design of these reforms need to focus on shifting incentives from rent seeking to productivity enhancing. And hopefully, with some more thinking, some more discussion, we will be able to do that. Thank you for the fantastic discussions. I wish we had more time for, for interaction and hopefully that's going to be the next time. And thank you to Ernest and Dragana for the uh, impeccable organization as usual. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. so much. Next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.